Good morning, Guardian! We got a very special episode for you today. Second half of today's show is going to be a debate on the removal of the chair of the National Libertarian Party, Joe Bishop Henchman. And uh, I got a lot of feelings about this, and, and uh, this is going to be a very interesting uh, debate. I'm very honored uh, to have uh, our three panelists so far who have stepped up for this. Oh, I will say, I am holding one slot open for the next hour if someone credible steps up. This is this has been, you know, uh, my position thus far towards, I, I, I was an open supporter, endorsed uh, Joshua Smith, in the last chair's race, Ditto. voted for him as a delegate, supported him uh, actively uh, as much as was appropriate, uh, was happy that uh, it was him versus someone as qualified as Joe Bishop Henchman. And I, I felt uh, pretty confident that regardless of who won, the LP chairmanship would be in good hands. Uh, but I, I did have my concerns uh, about uh, Joe Bishop Henchman. And uh, I, I, had, I had been happy to put them aside and say, you know what, if I don't hear anything, if it's just squirrely little shit around the edges, the people talking shit about the chair, it's going to happen. I'm going to support him. And I have functionally. I've, I've actually made this platform available to him and said, uh, you know, anytime you want to come on and do an interview, just friendly, tell us what's going on with you in the national chair. I, I would be honored to have the national chair of the Libertarian Party on to use this platform for whatever they want to broadcast. Well, you know, uh, no comment, more questions even. Comment feed says uh, breaking news: <clears throat> Agent Eight Rep Tucker Coburn has resigned, according to Justin O'Donnell, and rumor has it that JBH may be joining him tomorrow. Wow! Wow! So this is happening really fast, and and I I I mean to me, you know. It's sort of like who sits on the throne is so un unimportant when you'd rather destroy the throne. And what I love about the Libertarian Party is that we're the only political party. One of the things I love, one of the many things I love is that we're the only ones who would say oh, part of our goal is to put ourselves out of business. Like we you don't want to be doing this forever. The goal is not power for libertarians and, you know, no, take over the world. Leave everyone alone. And then the LP is a historical club, right? That's great. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, so Region 8 rep on the LNC. And this is this is a very inside baseball episode. I, I want to say we have Ed Vallejo join us as co-host uh, with comments. Comments are because Joey is watching comments. If people have questions, I want to, like, start the show by, like, co big caveat. We're going super political inside baseball on the LP. Now, the first half of the show, we're going to cover headlines. We got a lot of news to do. I'm going to do. The, I'm going to do my intro to the subject and blah blah blah. Uh, Steve R. Already Wayne. I feel like this is somewhat my fault for bringing up Tuesday. Steve. Well, no, Steve. You no. It's it, you gave me so Steve Remus, Arizona Libertarian Party activist uh, and candidate, came. You know, co-host Sam versus me on Tuesday. Brought this to my attention uh, the, on Tuesday, kind of spontaneous. It's just like we do a little, you know, rap with the co-host, like, hey, what's on your mind? You know, when we bring him on the show before they announce their comment contest. And with Steve, it's the Tuesday, it turned into a pretty significant discussion about all this. Although at the time he was still pretty uh pretty obtuse. And and I feel like this like this is happening really fast, which makes me want to be really cautious. And um I well, you know what? I so I I'm honored that Karen Ann Harlow's LNC secretary is joining us today on the side of the removal of, of our chair. Uh, Justin O'Donnell, J. Mary Jane, call Nick Sarwark. I texted Nick last night. I text, hold on, we're going to get to, hey, Justin O'Donnell, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Great LP activist out of New Hampshire, veteran and prior guest on Adam versus the man. Um, I'm pulling up my own Twitter here because I posted this. Uh, but first, to, to the panel, I really want to get this out. So in case we get another, someone else to defend I mean, to me, I'm kind of like Craig, find a JVH supporter. Good luck. I, I mean, I'm really just like I, I'm still neutral on the issue. 
I mean, I go like, I, 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 for a lot of these LP issues, I look to people like Carrie Ann Harlow's, like who's going to be on the show today, like Angela McCardle, who's also taking the uh, removal position, the anti JBH. Uh, for uh, she is she is the chair of the Los Angeles Libertarian Party. Uh, but uh, and 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 I want to give a shout out here because she, she these two women beat out uh, a number of others who wanted who were enthusiastic to take this uh, this role in the debate today of debating uh, against. JBH in favor of removing him. And actually three, three who deserve an honorable mention here. Uh, Robin Dominic, uh, co-chair of Missouri LP, reached out, or vice chair. Uh, Anthony Welty, uh, very respected activist. Uh, what is his actual position? I don't know. Anthony Welty visited here in Gardenia, even uh, Seattle area, sorry, Washington State Libertarian Party activist. Uh, solid credentials. Um, and Todd Agopian, former Libertarian Party national chair candidate, also is Libertarian in chief on Twitter. Uh, there were there were uh, half a dozen others who wanted to debate. So, like to me, I'm looking at this like, oh shit! Like I'm just, I'm coming in, reading the room, like one step behind all these people who are rushing into the room. Uh, I got to ask, do they represent the base of the Libertarian Party or the the activist, not the base, like the base membership or? the the voting base of the libertarian party but do they represent like the activist base the officer core if you will of the libertarian party um i i certainly have a lot of respect for all of their opinions and i only got one person they were credible and says david fight uh is going to be with us today uh david fight uh gave me his credentials as uh he and this is really interesting uh, I'll I'll wait to share what what he said when, when when he comes on at the top of the hour here. He's a New York State Committee member and outreach director for the Pragmatist Caucus. So I, I wish we could have he barely what I would say like credible Libertarian Party credentials on this. Um, but happy to have him. Definitely a credible Libertarian Party activist at David Fight on on Twitter. And if um, if someone else wants to step up like right now. Like in the next 15 minutes, essentially, um, let's make this a two on two. Because if not, it, it might not be much of a debate. Uh, is Jim staying on this? Well, no, because I, I want uh, I want people to show me. I want to I want to prove them that they. If, but yeah, um, if if you want email, well, no, Jim is producing. Email Joey. Justin O'Donnell's recommending Andy Craig. I've heard that name tossed around. Um, <laughs> I didn't reach out to him directly. I did reach out to jbh himself directly and i reached out because i have a cell phone number i also reached out to nicholas sarwark directly didn't hear although that was a little late all last minute i was shocked how fast we were able to pull this together but it feels pretty cool to be able to be like all right this happened let's just jump on it and do it right and have this conversation and and, and get it done um so joey there it is joey the freedom line will be joey will be watching your email and we'll check in, you know, as over the next hour, uh, 50 minutes now, before we get to uh, to this this debate. Although right now it's it's essentially a two on one debate, uh, and and I'm not I'm not going to try to pretend that that's a debate. I, we're we're going to make it appear. And and Angela and and David are friends, and like they you know they respect each other. Uh, B Horning too. The LP does a terrible job marketing. Speaking of which, uh, <laughs> we're going to come back to that topic. Uh -huh. Hard to market when you're shadow banned. Thank you for that. It's a very good point. Uh, so if someone else, if, if someone wants to join us, uh, we we have a spot open for uh, anybody who wants to take the position uh, in favor of JBH staying on his chair against the petition for him to resign. I also have Gillette Jarvis's cell phone number for those of you who are following this. And understand her role in this as chair of the New Hampshire Libertarian Party, one way or another. Yeah, I, I, this is a real like, why are people calling for him to resign? I mean, the crux of it is that he interfered uh, with the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire 
and aided in the theft of the party uh, and, and uh, basically gave the national recognition of the state affiliate to an illegitimate organization that stole even actual material stuff, uh, cameras, you know, basically the equipment, right, uh, from a storage unit for from the legitimate party. Now, I don't know what what Joe's role in this. There's a smoking gun email, apparently. Karen Ann Harlow's, uh, Joey and I listened to uh, most of her live stream video yesterday. And um, I, so I know that uh, based on her comments about Dave Smith, she's a, a fan of men with well-moisturized skin. So yeah. trying to trying to represent that on camera for her today, probably failing miserably. Maybe the lighting camera can compensate somehow a lot of um, to it. yeah right <laughs> okay so uh i'm gonna read this statement again when we when we kick off this this segment uh officially here at the top of the hour but joe bishop henchman uh you know i asked him if he wanted to join this debate he texted me back to say not doing public interviews on the topic you can read this as my statement quote I don't do public interviews dishing about internal LP matters because they are harmful to the party's growth and public perception. With respect to the New Hampshire situation, the claims made about me are false and motivated by factional vendettas. And my intellectual inclination in with, with what I'm facing, excuse me, which is like that, that for my own partisan reasons, I would be tempted to say, yeah, get out of there. But I don't want that as bad for the party. I would rather JBH do what Josh Smith would have done. I would rather he carry out his term uh, and then some I get to do what, what I wanted Joshua Smith to do. And then all the good things that Joe Bishop Henchman, you know, promised to do as, as a, a candidate for national chair as well. So I, like, I want to see him do well. I don't want to see this happen. I, I sympathize with his reasons. And if I'm the only one, like I, I kind of, def I, I'm going to be the one defending him here. <laughs> like, uh, uh <laughs> All right, uh, as devil's advocate. Remember debate class. Just yeah, just no, as devil's advocate. <laughs> <laughs> I never took debate class. You didn't? No. I'm shocked. No, I'm shocked. Um, I did a little public speaking education. Public speaking and debate. Like, hey. uh, but I never did any kind of real, like I've done debate. I did mock Senate. I played a drunk uh, Kennedy. Oh, that's fine. Uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. I was, I was actually drunk. As with a, with a gray wig. I argued in favor. I was shaved. I didn't have a beard. So I was like, I look like jowly, you know, and, and, and drunk and, and like red eyed and like, you know, red. I, I think we put rosy Aww. makeup on my cheeks. I was like, yeah, drunk Ted Kennedy. And we did. And this is for class. This is for um, with the the infamous Professor Pitney of That's Fairmont tough. McKenna College. Uh, not just that, but he's he's actually a respected uh, author and national political pundit. You hear him on and quoted in news stories like, you know, he'll get a sentence. Professor Jack Pitney of, of Claremont McKenna College said, quote, you know, <laughs> OK, yeah. well, you know. we did our mock debates in middle school and I got to argue for Ross Perot in the mock presidential debates. So, well, I got to do Michael Benarek in 2004 as president of libertarians of the Claremont Colleges, mm -hmm. but still. No formal debate training. None of the weird, like, learn the rules and argue. And, like, I've, I've argued. I mean, I can do it. I played Adam Loves the Man for a week, remember? I can do it. That was, but that was, that was like my catch up on debate exercise. I wouldn't watch. That was weird. <laughs> Some people couldn't handle it. It was me, yeah, me and being my evil twin, alter ego, Adam Loves the Man. Yeah, do it. All right. Uh, <laughs> but I, I might be like, and I, I, but here I'm just a skeptic. I'm not, it's not even arguing a position I'm against. But when I'm faced by like this, it, it's a sudden rush of condemnation and, you know, apparent evidence condemning Joe Bishop Benjamin. Uh, it, it, it's, it's enough that it, there's a bit of a fishy smell to it. And I know me, I know there are people involved who are motivated by aforementioned factional vendettas against Joe Bishop Benjamin. And that's a part of it. And I would be, I, I don't have a vendetta against him. Like I said, I think he's, even when, you know, my candidate lost to him, I thought he was more than good enough for me to enthusiastically support being chair of the party. And I have in good faith done everything like that and invited him to come on the show multiple times in person when we met last in person at the 
uh, Wisconsin State Convention. And um, I, I feel like now if, if I'm, I'm going to be playing his defense in this, in this debate today, like his defense attorney against these prosecutors coming in, uh, with David fight backing me up as a as a defense witness almost if it turns into that They're like I shouldn't say anything disparaging about my client Joe Bishop Benjamin but uh, yeah he hasn't come on the show and uh, declined to eat, get do more of a statement than this or uh, you know to, and and generally the policy like that he's articulating here uh, I agree with but this isn't dishing about internal LP matters. This is a credible accusation calling for the resignation of the chair of LP National. Um, so what's this rumor, Joey? Back to this. That, 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 where, where did you get this? And, and what, what is the source that you think? I got you might be actually Justin, resigning tomorrow. I got this from Justin O'Donnell. I saw the email on Facebook and just skimmed through it. Um, where his name escapes me, but I'm scrolling back up. Justin O'Donnell, JBH, was one of my closest allies when I was on the LNC with him, and I considered him a friend. When this happened, I reached out to him, and he brushed me off and insulted me for asking him. Mm. Yeah, Tucker Coburn resigned uh, early this morning. Region 8 LNC rep. Region 8, yeah. yeah. Uh, Again, if there's anything that I've said so far to anybody who's new here or who's just part of the Adam versus the Man audience, who has never been involved with the LP. If any of this goes over your head, because it's really basic shit, like, let me explain. LNC, the Libertarian National Committee, that's the board of directors, essentially, of the party. It's the leadership of the party. There is a chair who is the figurehead, the title, the authority, the sovereign, if you will, although, according to the bylaws, and as Nick Sarver would have said, the least important person in the party, but the, the actual authority head of the party is the chair of the LNC. Um, there's there's a, a vice chair, there's a secretary uh, who is Karen Ann Harless who will be joining us today, and uh, a treasurer, and then there are a board a group of board members elected to represent regions and at large membership. With I wonder why they don't do it by state. Why should well, the LNC could just be like you know either the every state affiliate gets to send one. But at dead, whatever. We're dealing with this whole dumb American political system where, like, by virtue of being a state, you get two senators. And you're like, wait, what? Like, not proportional representation. Well, we have that in the other house. But then we screw it up with the Senate. Like, ugh. yeah. Anyway, uh, enough Rich ranting Clark about the structure a, of the federal uh, government. A good point here. I think the only reason to keep him on board is procedural at this point. I want to give him and the other board members benefit the uh, benefit of the doubt, but damn, do they make it hard. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and like and just, we tried too. We wanted to get like it seemed like there was something more to this when we first hear started hearing all this nonsense, but and, and it I is don't know. it is not unfair to consider the most militarist confrontational analysis of of what we're doing for a second. You know, we're the Libertarian Party. We're not just another faction of politicians competing for a little share of the brass ring. Uh, we are saying that the, the whole system is corrupt and illegitimate and calling out all of the injustices of the world that happen uh, in the name of government. We we are, you know, insurgents, revolutionaries, whatever you want to call it. Like, we are the ones standing against the greatest source of injustice in the world today. As an opposing force here, there are going to be infiltrators. They're going to be spies. They're going to be saboteurs. There's going to, they're, they're going to do everything they can to stop them. As, or the, what, or at least it, commensurate with the market forces. Uh, motivating them, incentivizing them <laughs> to uh, perpetuate this government racket. That, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of fucking money when you add it up. And we're, to, we're pointing out to the world and the victims like, this is that. Make no mistake about it. That's who we are. This is what we're doing. We do have some important headlines to get to today. So with that, do I have any, am I missing any notes on this debate? 20 minutes of sufficient rambling preface from your host today. On this very cool segment. Uh, so yes, again, uh, Carrie Ann Harlos, LP National Secretary, Angela McCardle. I, I believe she's still technically chair of LP Mises, California, as well. 
just some yeah. significant, but she's trying to get away from that, right? As she's running for national chair to not be so, uh, caucus driven as much as someone who can be a unifying chair, yeah. that's appropriate. Uh, but also maintain a well-established position for herself as chair of Los Angeles LP. Uh, and David Fight, who is a committee man in New York and director of outreach for the Pragmatist Caucus, which is not an insignificant officer title to hold. Uh, it is a significant LP credentials as an activist. Yes, outreach director of the uh, Prag Caucus. Although I will say, uh, interesting news I found from Twitter this morning. Uh, Speaking of resignations, hmm. Pragmatist Caucus or Prag, Prag Caucus Chair Laura Ebke, who I'm a big fan of, consider at least a casual personal friend, a former state senator in Nebraska, who is really one of our party heroes, having switched as, a, as an elected representative from Republican to Libertarian, is uh, just resigned as chair of the Prague Caucus huh. and declined the opportunity to debate in defense of... of I, I did invite her, and, and I don't want to say why or reveal her I mean, my, I don't remember, actually. <laughs> uh, she did decline the invite um, to, to defend JBH on this one as well. So, 37 minutes. Any any emails, Joey? Yeah. Anybody want to do this? No? No emails yet. Very interesting. I put it out on the old interwebs. And, uh, yeah, I put it out on Twitter a couple times. Well, I should, I should check. I'll check my inbox. Meanwhile, executive producer Jim Freedom. Good morning. What's going on up there in Gardenia? It's going to be a very interesting day. I'm actually one of those people that I, I know enough because I've been doing the show with you. So I know more than I used to before I started with you about the LP uh, lingo and everything yeah. like that. But it, it's going to be a very educational experience today because I'm still kind of confused about what exactly happened and what's the root cause of the people rallying to get this guy removed and everything so, so am i so am i like i i a part of this debate uh, i mean is is me is going to be me asking questions why do you have this position what is your you know what are your facts and, and doing a sort of fact like is i i suppose jim i'm i'm one or two steps ahead of you in the rumor mill right now mm -hmm. but I, i'm putting together these things and i haven't bothered to like dig in and be like well let me see the emails well let me see the screenshots and it's like all right all right, I'm I'm, reser I'm I'm reserving judgment, you know, until. But I, I feel like this core narrative that I laid out is is the general understanding right now. But even that, I'm like I can't like I like I, I think I caveated that pretty well to say, this is what it seems like to me so far. This is the story I'm hearing. You know, I want to get the facts and the sources cited, and we will get to that today. Daniel Hayes, possible play. JBH resigns and center. Ebke gets put up for LNC chair. Ooh! The infamous Daniel Hayes also joining us this morning for this special episode. Very excited to have you with us, sir. Daniel Hayes, a uh, longtime Libertarian Party activist out of L Louisiana and organizer of National Convention. And just has put in a, a lot of great time organizing events for the LP. Would um, vice chair just step up though? Is that how it's worked? Uh, it could be that we just advise chair. Well, it depends. Um, uh, you know, put up for two. There, there are a lot of different ways. I think, you know, we always move to suspend the rules and do whatever the fuck we want as, you know, the LNC. Rich Clark, I feel bad for the members of the LP that held elected office as part of the duopoly because they got sick of the circus only to join our circus. We're supposed to be better. People like Amash and Epke. Okay, Rich, I, no, no, no. They joined knowing what this was about. Like, they... So when we're going into this and we got a black eye, they know that we didn't punch ourselves in the face. <laughs> you know, like Justin Amash comes in here and goes, oh, yeah, there's shit within the LP leadership. There's their disputes like no shit. He's not he's not turned off by that. I mean, not any more so than in in the Republican Party uh, and, and probably less so because here at least. To fuck with us, they don't get to back it up with, oh, yeah, and then we're going to start a war or then we're going to, you know, deprive your state of millions of dollars of federal funding. Like, no, we, we're not playing those games. But I I, I think people like Laura Epke and Justin Amash, 
uh, coming into the LP are way more tuned in than the average member of the LP as to the nature of political fuckery because they've seen a worse side of it. So no, don't try to make me self-conscious with that bullshit. Uh, no, no, the LP uh, has nothing to be ashamed of here. Of course, going into battle, we, we should be proud of our scars and our bruises. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I like that. They've, they've seen a lot more of the nasty that they know they need to oppose. Yeah. That's what they're doing here. So right, uh, we have some fun comment contests. Let's get some producer yeah, notes. Let's get to it. All right. <laughs> producer notes. Uh, I just wanted to explain the difference. The t.me forward slash Adam versus the man. That's a public telegram channel. That's mostly for show notes, uh, things about the show, talking about the show updates on the show. So if you want to know everything that's going on with the show, that's where you'll find that the private producers club that we talk a lot about is more of a conversation, an inside conversation with the people from Adam versus man. So it's a real cool thing to be a part of. If you want to just buy your way access to that, the $10 level on our Patreon is what gets you access to the private producers club. Uh, so definitely check that out and check out all the levels, see how you can take advantage of helping us out in that way. Uh, the garden of freedom is on Instagram. I'm sure you've seen it. Got plenty of pictures and videos of everything going up there in gardenia. So check out Instagram at the garden of freedom, great pictures and videos for you to love all day long. Make sure it's on your favorites, the crypto six.com. We had a guest on Ian Freeman yesterday who uh, blew your mind with explaining everything that's going on there. We showed you that the link gives you the address to where you can write to the guys in cages here still. Uh, so definitely check out the crypto six.com and click the links to donate to them and help them get their legal funding situation under control. Lastly, go green energy online.com, the best website for people that are thinking about going off grid, learning more about solar power, micro wind energy, zero energy homes, go green energy online.com's best website for do it yourselfers trying to get self-sustained, get yourself educated, have a beautiful day. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. I, and also the producers club is, we call it the producers club because people there help put the show together. We like, we got, uh, we do have a block of headlines. Now that we're 30 minutes into the show, we still got to get to the headlines. Uh, but yeah, a lot of them come. What's that? We need a longer show. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have to go back to the three hour format or we need to go back to talking faster and drinking tea during the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. In the co-host's chair today, keeping your comments coming on screen throughout the show, Ed Vallejo. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Adam. How you doing? I, I'm a, I'm libertarian from way back in the 2008 era, and I, I went over to Republican to for Ron Paul, so I've been fighting other dragons. I'm just coming back, back in the... LP and try and figure out what's going on, get the feel. I don't really know anything about the participants here other than what I've heard from the people that I've come in contact and just you and what I'm doing here. Okay. I don't know yeah. anybody from anybody, but I, what I do know is in 08, when I watched the party of principle get torpedoed by a man named Barr and another man named Root, Okay, now you guys got this thing going on currently, and I'm looking at the players, and what's this guy's last name again? <laughs> oh, Bishop Henchman, yes, yes. It is uh, Henchman. One of those, okay. you know, now, the Henchman is it, uh, isn't uh, being a very liberty-minded libertarian. Is that the gist of it? I mean, let me, let me ask you a question, Ed. If, if you became a libertarian and your last name was like Mussolini or Tyrant or Trump or Fascism, like what you would change your last name, right? At what point do you not have to change your last name? Okay, well, my, my well, my basic question, I get I get the basic questions pop in my mind. Was this person i want to i want to say was this man but somebody will jump on me because i'm it might be not a man using a different i don't know about genders nowadays or not i don't want to i want to be politically correct uh was this person born with the last name of henchman uh that's that's just a basic question of mine if see it, now if we're is, gender confused on anybody named joe because we had joe jorgensen 
Joe Bishop Henchman. How many other Joes? Then we have Joey. Then we have our Joey, J O I E. Like, seriously, people, can we not be more creative with our names? Okay, enough dumb jokes about his last name. We are going to get to get to that. And and Ed, I will say your role as co-host today and your perspective is very valuable. If there are questions you want to ask, I'm going to call this not really a debate. I mean, I, I'm debating for myself what side of this I'm on. What should my role be in this? As right. a delegate, which way do I vote on this maybe? Um, there's this weird hangover where we, the delegates of the 2020 convention, are the ones who put this lnc in place um and might be called to vote again virtually at some i don't know in some suspension of the rules justin o'donnell i don't know whose name was pre-marriage but jbh's husband is a deacon in a church their last name is bishop 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 henchman and they are clergy and a lawyer now this is sort of like the, uh, the nick sarwark he's a lawyer and a used car salesman and his last name is sarwark okay um are they rubbing our faces in it? This is just bad COINTEL pro jokes. I, I want to take this issue seriously. I don't want to condemn before evidence is assessed here. But there's been enough evidence of squirrely shit and shit for, like with Sarwark. So Bishop Henchman, when I hear the henchman, I think of uh, henchman to Sarwark. Um, Sinister minister is what my brain said. Ah! Uh, but, I, you know, uh, uh, Bishop yeah, the, I, I mean, careers in law and religion are problematic, just like being, you know, a, a used car salesman might be problematic. Uh, but I'll leave it at that. I don't want to cast aspersions when there's a serious no. accusation based on silly, superficial shit. And that's what this is. But what is serious is his conduct as chair. Uh, you know, what transpired with this series of events around New Hampshire and Gillette Jarvis recently. And, uh, you know, if wh or whether or not he should be removed at these calls. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, I hear Karen Ann saying this and I go, well, we better have Karen Ann on the show. And I go, well, this is a serious enough topic. Let's get some more voices and, and challenge the evidence on the air and uh, and get some balanced opinion. So Ed, if there are questions that, that you don't hear me asking you want to, or commenters and you want to write comments yourself, and we'll probably bring you up towards the end of this conversation on screen with our panel to see, make sure that, you know, as someone who's coming in with the political background, but not the relevant immediate party background, if you're satisfied with, with our examination of the issue. Right. right? So yeah. you also have a comment contest today. Yeah. Yeah. Best LP joke. I haven't heard a good LP joke in a long time. Okay? Best Not necessarily LB a joke, joke about the party, but, you know, just a, a party-related joke, you know. Like, how, I thought the how LP you had nothing but bad jokes. That's We have good jokes, too? Well, get your best good yeah. joke about the LP out. Um, I yeah. kind of wanted to add an I kind of want to piggyback on this one because sure. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, a, a comedy bit. Um, okay. Based on Jeff Foxworthy's You Might Be a Redneck, yeah. Yes. If you have a Blue Lives Matter sticker on your vehicle, you might be an NPC. If you pay as much in taxes as the government will let you, you might be an NPC. If you enthusiastically vote Democrat or Republican, you might be an NPC. If you were first in line to get a COVID vaccine, you might be an NPC. If you're more afraid of COVID than the police, you might be an NPC. If you've never heard of the non-aggression principle, you might be an NPC. So non-player character, NPC. I guess I should have explained that first for those of you. But Ed gets this term for being an OG video game player from decades, two, dec two decades ago. GTA. When the term, oh, geez. Uh, when the term <laughs> first became uh, a thing all the way to uh, 10 years ago or so, we determined that NPC, non-player character, became a political term. And I think a very appropriate one of derision in in contrast to the libertarian message, which includes be free. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a skinny libertarian as opposed to thin as opposed to thick, as in libertarianism just means this. But I am thick in the implication. And the implications are live well, engage with the world 
as an individual consciousness with 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 wants and hopes and desires to to love and to serve and to create and enjoy don't be a fucking npc uh there you go that's my rant uh so ed just to get out of the way the first part of our uh our headline stack today we do have a few interesting weather headlines because we are in the middle of a heat wave right now and it's not just any old heat wave it's it, it, for us here in gardenia it's a little early but it's also record setting our first headline from accuweather mercury soars to 125 at death valley amid scorching heat wave holy shit and apparently this is 10 degrees from our uh global world all-time record i'm like whoa that was 136 but no death valley is the record holder for the highest air temperature ever recorded on earth a sizzling 134 degrees fahrenheit in 1913. i stayed around that it was valley not a this very winter. good year i am thoroughly <laughs> convinced that this is due to them using chemtrails pushing the jet stream north and creating a drought here in california so we cannot produce food. Hold on, we're going to get to that, Ed. But you all, you're wearing a 1913-themed T-shirt today, aren't you? Yes, I am. They call me Ed with Ed. Ed. You know, I've been, I've been, right. I was Arizona State coordinator for Ed Fed for years in a row. I, you know? I, I, I couldn't ignore that weird numerology coincidence to point out that 1913 was also the hottest ever air temperature recorded by humans on earth, Death Valley, California. Um, but you're, so when we complain about this in Gardenia and, and here in Gardenia, it does once or twice a year spike to the to, to around 105 and we go, holy crap, it's still nice at night. It was real, like last night sleeping with just a fan. Right. Not even, right. no air can, you can make it through the year here with well, managed shade and fans and no air conditioning and that's you can't do that in phoenix can you ed is from phoenix or sort of originally right what yep. what's and it's it's consistently like 20 degrees warmer in phoenix than gardenia if not more it's but this is like nothing to you right pretty much no it just it's warm you know but i grew up as a kid in phoenix my brother and I used to, on Saturday, we'd walk to Greyhound Park to the swap meet barefoot, you know, so it was no big deal to us. <laughs> we took the puppies out yesterday to run errands, Thelma and Louise, and they were having trouble walking on hot, dry mud, like, you know, an adobe-ish surface, just in a, a little pond bed that had dried up, going, oh, 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 see the puppies dance on the hot dirt was kind of fun. Um, we had we had a gallon of milk explode <laughs> being left sort of out yesterday. Uh, another one though, slightly different phenomenon. We'll bring it back to the oh, drought. My juice fermented in the heat. Juice fermenting in the heat in Gardenia. Oh. Um, this is it's why we do food storage in an above ground root cellar. It's a two hundred dollar fine in Phoenix if you take your animal on the trail and possible jail time. Wow. Well, I, yeah, appropriate. Wow. I mean, I hate to say like, I mean, I hate to support any status law of that nature, but if, yeah, not I, making people if, creating a victim, if, and making, yeah, no, know. you are creating, it is animal abuse. Absolutely. And something that people like, I, I, I'd like to think, you know, Ed, that, and you know, you see me around our, our giant cloud of fur babies here. Uh, I'm pretty tuned into animals, but you know, even for me, like Joey and me, we're walking in flip flops. Dogs are barefoot. And I saw, hey, we're on, we're, we parked in the blacktop and we're like, we got to get the puppies to the dirt like right away and, and made, and, but then, oh, God, right. they're still cow in the dirt. They're still uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah and I, in Phoenix, just a, a dirt, a packed dirt trail. You're not going to walk barefoot in the summer in Phoenix. And that would, that would be animal abuse. Oh. I, like I said, I hate that, I hate that government is the mechanism of us dealing with that issue, but it's better that we're dealing with it than not probably. And in Phoenix, there are a lot of dumb Babylonian statists there who have dogs who just moved there and moved into air conditioning. Oh, take my dogs for a walk. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want you to have to deal with government, but I really don't want you to do that. All right, so hold on, different, different weather phenomena now. We're gonna bring it back, accuweather.com. Massive cloud of dust sweeps across Atlantic, heads toward U.S. 
Jim, can you get that satellite picture on screen? It's it's pretty stunning. Uh, I almost saved this for Good News Friday just to be like, look how cool it is that we can see this. Justin O'Donnell, I just want him to post more kitten pictures on Twitter. Well, hey, Justin, if you want the full collection of kitten pictures, it's Instagram at the Garden of Freedom. But no, uh, Jim, pull up that satellite picture again, please. This is this is the uh, wait. Is that the satellite? Is that that's like a computerized image. But even that we can see on that massive scale, we can step back and look at the Earth and go, yeah, there it is. There's the actual satellite image. That's a dust cloud from the Sahara. And, and you know, you, I, I, you know, if, if I got to attach a label, environmentalist libertarian is not a bad one. But as a capitalist, it's that I want to see the value maximized, uh, you know, from natural resources. And if there's a chance that we can come together as, as a human family and go, this is a global resource, well, you know, let's let's address this. Let's incentivize people voluntarily coming together to go, hey, maybe we should be uh, terraforming the desert. And I'm not I'm not a conservationist. Conservationism is preserve it exactly as it is. No, like here in Gardenia, this is part of a, 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 a maturing forest of junipers. It's beautiful to see. And, you know, we go, well, hey, man, you know, giant dust clouds blowing across the Atlantic from the Sahara's natural. We got to conserve the natural pattern. Hey, maybe we got to terraform this shit. Maybe maybe we should be planting trees. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we should be irrigating. Yeah. Maybe hemp. Maybe yeah. we'll grow paper in the desert with irrigation. Two birds with one stone kill the dust clouds and the uh, deforestation issues. And anyway, it's to me, this is exciting. But it's it's also right now this is a destructive weather phenomena. Newsweek with the next related headline: Florida set to have incredible orange skies as massive Saharan dust cloud approaches. Ooh, Ooh, so there's a cool cool side effect, right? Now, finally, to bring it back to, to some good weather news for the droughts, weather.com: tro uh, Gulf tropical system could drench one of America's most rain fatigued rage regions tropical rain to bring gulf coast flood threat and i go god damn it why do people still live in these places but uh at least yes uh we are seeing some relief on the horizon but bloomberg at yahoo.com next headline california walking a tightrope as hydropower supply fades and you go God damn it, Newsom. God damn it, fucking California government manipulating the water supply and the droughts and all the Central Valley farmers and really a critical part of America's food supply. Fuck you, California government. Uh, now, walking tightrope. Uh, the, 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 the wind farms, the manipulation, the alternative energy, really just, I can't say it enough. Fuck the California government. Read the weather headlines. You will say it that much harder. They're out of control. Didn't and didn't we find out that uh, California? <laughs> didn't we find out California had created tubes to where they were sucking water out of Lake Mead? <laughs> I think that came up. Yeah, I feel like I've heard this story before. There's the, the manipulation of natural resources by the California state government, especially the water supply, is fucking criminal. And that they do this while looking at the rest of America and showing their citizens. Oh, we're the friendly, liberal, environmentally conscious state government. Look at us. Keep electing Democrats in California. You go, really? You're the most corrupt motherfuckers there are. Yeah, I mean, real, like, I, the only thing that keeps you from being as bad as the Federal Reserve is that you, you're fucking farm league. Because you're state level instead of federal. But you're just as fucking evil. And really, California government, uh, yeah, it, what is it? Seventh largest economy in the world if it broke off. And I'm, I'm also... A member of the Cal Exit Congress. I, I want, you know, I'm, I'm I'm invited as a non-state resident by Chair Marcus Ruiz Evans to be uh, a part of that effort to see California break off because the evil of the state government of California is only empowered, exacerbated by the way that the federal government and the Federal Reserve makes it all possible. Lauren S. Arizona is still on fire too. Globe slash Telegraph has been burning for like 13 days. Yeah, I, I don't know. Ed, do you want to speak to that in particular, having a little more knowledge of that area? Um, they're evacuating people out of there. It's There's a valley there that is just going to get it. There's no two ways about it. They got to pull people out of there or they aren't going to make it. And when, when I was in Phoenix this last weekend, 
the sunsets were just, it was incredible. The red sun. I mean, at four o'clock in the afternoon, the sun was bright and red. <laughs> well, I, I'll just, I got, I got to insert the Here. one snarky libertarian point of this is what you get for trusting government with fire safety. It's fucked. Like we would be <laughs> capable of so much better. Like, and it's sad. It, and you want to talk about wildfires in California over the last year too. That people in California, I mean, I, we use the term Babylonian like derogatorily here to be like, yeah, fucking Babylonians going into these California suburbs. Well, there's a paved road. There's utilities. Government said it was safe. They've got a fire department that covers this area. Uh, and then, no, fucking wildfires. You're all evacuated and houses burned down. What's this? Um, this is the Telegraph fire that Jim's got pulled up. Uh, that's Telegraph here in Arizona. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to say good or bad about this particular thing because it could be some, some wildfires are good. Some they some need forests it. need them for regular turnover. But we could manage this. And even Colorado, that so much Colorado does it better than anybody in the country. They are always controlled burning. They're See, I believe that. Rarely something you know, that gets out of control. And you're talking the government of the state government of Colorado. But I believe what you say, because this, the residents of Colorado are way more genuinely conscious than the residents of California, from my experience. Yeah. People go, people, there's a lot of thoughtless Babylonians in California, way more proportionate. Whereas in Colorado, you have a lot of people living rurally who go to Colorado to be connected to nature, who are conscientious of that, who, although they are going, they're statists and maybe Babylonians, they are at least going to demand a higher standard from their state government than in California and leave less room for fuckery in environmental resource management. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Uh, yeah, I mean, having around? lived in Colorado for about two years, there's, there's a certain sense of community and conscientious, con conscientiousness that doesn't really exist yeah. in mass like that. Yeah. You know, in it's, a, it's a cool it's Colorado really culture a statewide thing. thing yeah. You know, it's not like yeah. pocketed. Well, except for Denver, they suck. All right, all right. We got to get to some serious headlines before our big debate feature of today's show. Anyway, we talk about weather for ten minutes. Fucking eight. All right, Ed, the comment contest one more time, please. Best LP joke, or you or if blank, you might be an NPC. All right. So, although I would say blank, it's kind of you an might NPC be joke. an NPC. <laughs> all right. CBSNews.com. Big headline. With moratorium ending, more than 8 million households face foreclosure or eviction. Even as the nation rebounds from the coronavirus pandemic, more than 2 million homeowners are behind on their mortgages and risk being forced out of their homes in a matter of weeks, a new Harvard University housing report warns. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say I got this one wrong on the timing. That they, uh, I thought this was going to happen soon. But I knew this was coming and that this was going to be I read there, this there's going a few to months be ago. Going to an eviction crisis. And we've been covering this. Well, I, no, I really thought that, it, well, what happened was there was the forced unemployment crisis of March 2020. And then there was, oh, shit, there might be an eviction crisis coming. And then there were all these policy machinations, machinations. <laughs> government bullshit uh, moratoriums on evictions assistance you know and and now that they're running out you go I, could they extend it forever like and i go adam you should have known that they were going to extend it as long as they could get away with maybe now that the actual sort of uh intensity or the the urgency of economic sacrifice to deal with the the pandemic is fading they're not able to uh, maintain that momentum of their policies. Um, so let's see. Most of the homeowners at risk of foreclosure are either low income or families of color, said researchers who published the 2021 State of the Nation's Housing Report. Congress has dedicated $10 billion to help homeowners get caught up on payments, but it's unclear if that funding will make it to families before mortgage companies begin sending out foreclosure notices. And one thing, because I've, I've never had a mortgage, you know, I'm not really familiar with what it's like from the inside, but apparently you get a lot of leeway before they evict you, right? Like, I mean, it's this weird system where yeah, they, they get you tied in. I mean, how long can you default 
you know, or, you know, how many payments can you miss before they'd rather you default and apply penalties and then evict you because that means you have no equity in the house and they own it even more, right? That's part. Like, I'm not saying I think they just I'm not pointing out. Oh, look at this it. good thing I didn't know about. But but then you own less of that. It, you keep pay, what they want you to do is pay for the maintenance on a building that they own while paying rent on it and not actually building any equity. That's the fundamental incentive of the banks as mortgage loaners, right? Lenders. They they want you. So I mean, come on, they, they, they don't want you to like get the best terms and own like now some, uh, this is not to, to disparage individual loan officers or bank tellers or any of the, you know, end point retail individuals you might deal with as, you know, your gateway to the machine that is the banking system and, and, and the, the, you know, these corporate entities. So remember, be nice, be nice. And they'll, you know, like, like, like I told our, <laughs> our our helpful friend with Verizon Authorized Retailer, TCC, yesterday, hey, look, as long as you keep giving me confidence, you're working the machine best to my advantage. I'm not going to complain. Uh, but the machine, when it comes to the mortgage industry, is a much bigger and more vicious one. And uh, I don't think you're going to see a, uh, a, a, a sudden crashing of a wave of foreclosures but you will see a foreclosure crisis it will be identifiable as such and there will be surprise surprise further consolidation of wealth and power in the wake of covid right mm -hmm. all right the washington free beacon we're going to really have to, we, it was a lot of fun set up in today's we're show we got to run through some big headlines here washington free beacon race-based bailouts and covid stimulus bill face legal setbacks and uh, this is about the $1.9 trillion Coronavirus Relief Act that includes a loan forgiveness earmarked for minority farm owners and entrepreneurs. And, you know, I am as sympathetic as anyone to the plight of minorities here in the United States. So I'm not against necessarily reparations based on, uh, it should be individual experiences rather than race experiences. And if it happens through some clumsy, whatever bullshit government thing, I'm not trying to take a position for or against that. I don't want government to have anything to do with this, obviously. But um, I love eating the sn watching the snake eat its own tail and the sort of logic unraveling where it's like, well, well we're going to have special uh, benefits for the military and for veterans. And well, then we have to have special benefits for the LGBT. And then, then we have to have special benefits for first responders and cops. And then we have to have special benefits for these minorities and this victim class and that victim class and this favorite government class. And you go, really? It's not gonna work. We're all citizens of the empire here. Can't we all just get along? Uh, Andrew Whitmer, you might be an NBC if you don't understand the irony of flying a thin blue line next to Gadsden flag. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I'll write much that down. Too. And I write so this, write this down on my list. If if I, I'll, I'll reword that, but I like your point there. If, if you don't get the irony of a thin blue, blue line next to a Gadsden flag. Yeah, that's uh because that you see that no, uh, all the time. Yeah. I have had arguments, arguments, discussions <laughs> with good friends of mine who and they don't identify as libertarian, but when you talk to them, like they really, really are. Uh but but they, they don't get that. They all don't right. understand. Can we do the rest of the headlines in five minutes with no more sidebars? Probably not. No. Uh maybe should I turbocharge this in with some COVID vitamins since it's Thursday. We we didn't like formally stop for COVID vitamins. I'm probably gonna need this before our panel. Apparently, our guest two of three, and this again goes to the, the weirdness of the situation. Um, Karen and Angela, uh, both taking the remove JBH position, are backstage waiting, uh, chomping at the bit here. Uh, whereas David fight is, uh, we're so, although not necessarily having to be early, the, I, I kind of want to share, um, a little bit of the private conversation between me and David fight. Um, the last thing he said is this is a super fucked situation. And I wrote back super fucked how and he hasn't responded. That was, that was, uh, Yesterday at 10.46, I asked him at 6.08 a.m. this morning, Justin O'Donnell with an LP joke. I'm just happy that the LNC could agree that New Hampshire was a place. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that that is funny. I got to explain that for the new people, too, because it should be funny anyway. Like, it's funny on multiple levels. Um, but 
last year, the biggest debate on the LNC was for bylaws interpretation purposes and a virtual convention. Is the internet a place? <laughs> that, that, that argument was great. That one was fun. Ugh, that, that whole thing made me drink last year a lot. <laughs> uh, so, with great respect uh, for our guests waiting backstage, I hope you don't mind me taking a few minutes to at least skim through the rest of these headlines while we wait for David Fight to join us and possibly anybody else. This is really the last chance. I got no Last email. chance. No email. Joey's checking your email. I got no response. We'll check again in five minutes. Five minutes here. Joey Top of the, the hour on line. Showtime. We will uh, We will check in at joeyatthefreedomline.com. Really, anybody who's a credible Libertarian Party activist, um, any kind of, like, you could be a county county bathroom coordinator for the Libertarian Party affiliate of, you know, bumfuck Egypt County, whatever it is. I don't care. Uh, really, anybody credible as an LP activist, someone who's been a candidate, you run a successful campaign as a libertarian, I'll count that now. We're lowering the bar. Anybody wants to come on and uh, defend JBH in, in this. Otherwise, it's just going to be a, it's not going to be much of a debate. Uh, but we'll see. All right, let's see. Um, yeah, okay, we got bios for them. All right, we're all ready for this. But CNBC.com and Drudge Report want you to think the big headline of the day is Obamacare survives after Supreme Court rejects latest Republican challenge, which, as far as I'm concerned, is kind of like just partisan back and forth. Of course, you know, with how much tyranny this law is going to stand. OK, some esoteric challenge and, and the Supreme Court shot down the state of Texas because they didn't have standing to show that they were harmed by the law. Uh, and, and I'm just encouraged by this. Like, I. Uh, the federal government wants to shove Obamacare down everybody's throats. Well, welcome to the party, Texas independence movement, American military news.com. And this is the one I wanted to get into. We might have to come. I, I hate to say this. We might have to really come back to this one. Biden launches domestic terrorism strategy, targeting anti-government ideology, white supremacy, and more. Yeah. There's no way I'm covering this on a skim. And then the, I covered this. I mentioned these headlines yesterday. Gateway Pundit, Big Brother, Biden administration wants Americans to report radicalized friends and family to government. No, we're going to have to come back to that. But related story from the Associated Press, editors of Hong Kong newspaper arrested under security law. Not, not surprising, right? Hong Kong police used a sweeping national security law Thursday to arrest five editors and executives of a pro-democracy newspaper on charges of colluding with foreign powers the first time the legislation has been used against the press and yet another sign of intensifying crackdown by Chinese authorities in the city, long known for its freedoms. And if you're not following the bigger story, this is just part of Beijing, which is the reference for China's national government, because it's the capital, uh, taking over Hong Kong over the last year and a half. The coronavirus giving them the, the cover, uh, greater uh, ability to suppress dissent, to suppress protest, which have been masked in mass in the streets, despite Beijing's attempts to suppress that freedom under Hong Kong's uh, what uh, one, one country, two systems concept after having been an in semi-independent autonomous territory under British rule for decades, being turned over. Uh, now China saying, uh, this is 1997 when the British colony of Hong Kong was handed over. It became an economic powerhouse because of relative economic freedom. Of course, it's geographical location, uh, port trade benefits uh, made it possible. But now China goes, you can't, no, you can't do this. And the last year and a half has been brutal, literally. And this step, editors of Hong Kong newspaper arrested under security law represents the Chinese government going, oh yeah, yeah, time to take over the press too. Yeah, if you don't toe the line, and so I'm hoping that there's going to be some, you know, whiplash effect that the people of Hong Kong, although a lot of them are just leaving. And, and this is like, do people stand and fight or do, do, do a lot of a lot of the foreign nationals doing business in Hong Kong? Um, you know, are going, yeah, we don't know. We're not dealing with Beijing. We're, we're out of here. Um, but this might be a catalyst. I would hope my in my own, you know, activist fantasy world. That, uh, that this this would spur uh, some true Hong Kong independence movement to action. That you know you can't even give a large central government like China's the benefit of the doubt here. 
mirror.co.uk inside Vladimir Putin's 390 million pound. That's not weight. That's British pounds. Playing with gold-plated toilet as it arrives for Joe Biden talks. And I was thinking about this because I make this as a joke. This is like one of my favorite dad jokes. We were walking out of Home Depot yesterday. Or was it earlier this week? And we had, we had been in and out because we were looking for a, a solar charge controller because someone else sent us there. And they didn't have any of the solar gear at Lowe's or Home Depot. Apparently. And I was walking out and this lady goes, ah, that was a quick trip. You were all out of to toilet seats made out of solid gold. We're going to Lowe's. You know? <laughs> And he says, I'll be in Monday. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. <laughs> great dumb joke. And it's actually, uh, it, it, it's a Mike Myers reference. It's Austin Powers. You know, well, I wanted a toilet seat made out of solid gold, but some things just aren't in the cards, baby. Well, you could get a gold plated toilet at least if you're Vladimir Putin. And you know why we hate these fuckers? Because the people who have access to these resources think that having a gold plated toilet on an airplane is more important than using that money to serve their people. Even to be more power, they care more about this, the, the appearance, the luxury, this kind of bullshit, which is why the next headline from the Associated Press, I misread because it said I, I, when I first saw this headline, I thought it was more than 30 politicians mutilated on Southern California coast. And I was like, <gasps> really? And then I was like, oh, more than 30 pelicans <laughs> mutilated bad. on Southern California coast. And that is a sad headline. Another big internet outage, CNN business with this headline, airline and bank websites go down in another major internet failure. Yeah. Judicialwatch.org from our producer's club. I think it was Ant sent us this one. Federal prison inmates escape undetected and undetected deceive guards with dummies in bed. What? This is, this is like Alcatraz shit with paper mache from when I was a kid. This still happens. Wow, we got a $4 super chat, Justin O'Donnell. Super sticker, thank you for joining us with that today. Uh, I, I think it's time to get into it. Uh, Ukraine, no, Ukraine police arrest multiple Klopp ransomware gang suspect. That's happening. They want you to know they're, they, they are fighting. Government is working to protect you. Uh, do we, we still don't have David with us, apparently. Hmm. Um, thank you to the patience of our other panelists, but it might be, uh, might just be me and Karen Ann and Angelo this morning. If David is back, I mean, the last I heard, like I said, this, this is like this is really this is really Maybe weird. This is okay. really weird how this is happening. No, David, still according to our executive producer Jim. Uh, the last I heard, I mean, so I was I asked David fight. Um, so I I said, well, I'll give I'll give you all the whole exchange here. Um, I said, what is your position on the issue and what is your email for my booker? On the New Hampshire issue in general, I haven't picked a side, but when it comes to JBH, I support him and do not think he should resign. And I said, great, you're in. You'll get an email soon. Do you know anyone else who wants to defend JBH? He said, I'm asking around. This is a super fucked situation. Now, this is all happening very fast, so I, I want to be cautious to never blame anyone for inaction, although he did agree to come on the show. Uh, but the last thing he said is this is a super fun situation. That was 1046 p.m. last night. This morning, 608 a.m. I wrote super fucked how question mark. No response. Daniel Hayes. It's almost like the Prags coordinated to stay silent on this thing. Daniel, do you want to join us for this one? Is it Daniel, you don't have to have a position or debate one way or another, but I think if it was. You and Angela and Karen Ann, it would be a stronger panel, and I'd love we to have you join us. Andrew Daniel Olding in the comments. AJ Olding, yes. Yeah, he said that sure. um, while while he is not on the side of JJ. Hold on, hold on, hold on, oh. hold on. Andrew Olding, I see this. AJ, come on, dude. You should have reached out to Gilletta Jarvis. Already did. Did that. Already did. Now, Richard Manzo, as a defender of ABH, not as obvious, but uh, if he's ready, have him on. If he's not, have him on. Uh, have him on next week if this is still a relevant topic. But if JBH resigns tomorrow, as per the rumor today, Justin O'Donnell just texted David. Um, yeah, I don't have David fight sell, so thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, I, I'm going to, let's see, just double checking with my backstage here. Uh, no, David, Steve Remus thinks he can be objective enough to defend JBH if you want him to. He said, yeah. So let's, I mean, let's see if we can get, uh, if we can get, if we get Steve and Daniel plugged in. Um, so if you guys can email Jim at the, Jim at the freedom line.com. 
Steve is already backstage because he's producer club. Yeah. Steve, All right, Daniel. If I wasn't there. using my phone, I wait. Do I have Daniel on Telegram? Daniel Hayes, if you send me a message on Telegram, I'll I'll send you the uh, the Streamyard link. We're gonna. This is very fun. Very very fun happening live time. Uh, all right, a couple quick headlines also to skim while we're waiting for that to come together. SFGate.com Fentanyl has changed the whole landscape. San Francisco faces worst drug epidemic ever. I thought the government made drugs illegal and people stopped doing them. They didn't, supposed to have them. They didn't happen. Illegal. Uh, a physician, two nurses, a professional athlete, a drug dealer, and a lawyer who had nodded off in court. Teenagers, specifically a 14 and 15 year old and a seven year old who got into a stash in her mother's purse. These are some of the types of people. Dr. Christopher Caldwell, the chief of emergency medicine at Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital, has recently seen in the emergency room for medical issues related to fentanyl use and overdoses. Caldwell said, quote, that's just in the last couple of weeks. It's really remarkable because it runs the entire spectrum. This affects all walks of life, all folks. It's hard to overstate how impactful it can be to anyone who doesn't seem to care about race or background or gender or anything. Well, you know, just like the vaccine, everybody's doing it, so you should too. Get on fentanyl, kids. Duh. Duh. Government said it was safe because fentanyl was like approved for something. It's just now that it's being distributed illegally because government, whatever. I have so many sidebars on that. Yeah, I know. Lauren Aswain and Richard Longstreth would absolutely defend JBH has been the whole time on public list. All right, good to know. Uh, if the panel, if we don't have a, a true defender of JBH on the panel today, like I said, this is happening very fast. I, I made the decision in putting this together to favor expediency over perfection. This is not, we're not trying to do a perfect, you know, Oxford rules debate on the thesis of this, you know, uh, petition to remove JBH. We're having a discussion to figure out from people who might trust, you know, how, how to look at this and, and maybe what the LP should do moving forward. Um, do it. Co-hosts, uh, David didn't respond to either. Um, so do we, do we have, Dan, is Daniel going to join us? All right. From nine to five Mac.com. Interesting headline from Europe, UK competition watchdog investigating Apple and Google smartphone platform duopoly as in the play store and the app store, Apple, what it was, iOS, what do they call it? The app store and the Google play store. Uh, the group will investigate dominance of iOS and Android and the control they wield over the App Store, Google Play Store, and Safari and Chrome. Not too hopeful, but interesting to see if a good shakeup comes out of this. Fun headline from Infowars.com video. Roger Waters tells little prick Zuckerberg to fuck off following request to use iconic Pink Floyd song for ad. I love this. Yeah, they wanted to use another brick in the wall part two in an ad for Instagram. See, this is why I'm like, let's let's say let's let's burn our Foo Fighter CDs and go buy some Pink Floyd think, vinyls. If we do vinyls, yeah. Um, Waters noted the deep irony of Facebook wanting to buy and use a song that rails against thought control and mindless conformity. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, CBS Chicago, Chicago speed cameras turn out hundreds of thousands of tickets after rule change. <laughs> of course they did. If you live in Chicago, be watching out for that. Um, I think, I think that's, um, uh, that's it for, for any of our, we have some January 6th stuff we got into. Uh, apparently this from the new American, this is another one we're going to have to come back to probably Monday, maybe next Tuesday because mental health Monday. I don't want to talk about Newly released government documents indicate FBI may have orchestrated January 6th insurrection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but here's a quick one we can get it out of the way from Daily News. Elaine Maxwell's jail cell flooded with raw sewage. <laughs> he says, yeah, that's actually normal in American jails from my experience. But uh, so much more to that story yet to come out because remember, Jeffrey Epstein didn't hang himself. All right, let's just go ahead and do this. Who do we have? I don't want to keep our guests waiting any longer. Ladies, thank you so much for your patience for being early to today's show. So um, first, Jim, uh, do we have anybody else join us now last minute? We have Steve. 
So let's get, we'll do Justin Steve. Justin O'Donnell Steve. says David misunderstood the time zone. Justin, if you're in contact with David, tell him it's not too late. Not too late. Not too late. Well, we're doing the introductions. Jim at the Happy to get him and make the case today. But we're going to go ahead and kick this off with whoever we got here. So we have Steve Remus backstage. Let's get him on to start. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve, uh, Arizona State activist who brought this to our attention Tuesday, co-host of Adam versus the man. Steve, any, any other critical credentials you want to lay out for this? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm an active candidate for the Libertarian nominee for governor of Arizona. So, um, you know, uh, I've tried to remain as objective as possible uh, in, in everything that has come out. So... Yeah, it's it's delicate. so so you you're relatively new to this in the party insider stuff, and yeah. you have an interesting stake in it as a candidate looking to put forth a major effort to serve the cause here in Arizona, and not wanting to like a lot of us are in a weird position where it's uh, let's just not piss anybody off, right? Let's not be <laughs> factionalist, and uh, we want to get along with everybody. We want to work with everybody while knowing. There are people in our ranks who are infiltrators, who are saboteurs, who don't have the best interests of the party or the cause in mind. So thank you for joining us and bringing this to our attention originally on Tuesday. And Ed, of course, who is off screen still, but will be keeping comments coming, representing the audience and the perspective of a lot of people with a similar new to the inside baseball perspective. So up next, Angela McArdle currently chairs the Libertarian Party of L.A. County. That's Los Angeles. Uh, and serves on the executive committee of the LP of California. She is a two-time congressional candidate for California's 34th district, has worked in litigation for over 10 years with a focus on property rights and constitutional law. Angela, thank you for your patience and for joining us on short notice this morning. Uh, anything else you want to lay out for credentials today? Well, I'm running for chair of the national party. So, you know, there's that, but that's more like an important disclosure at this point, but thank you. Cause I did forget that I, I meant to include in your introduction uh, that you have announced and are looking to, to run for chair. And so you're looking at this possibly with an eye to there being some midterm shakeup even before uh, the 22 convention and election. I guess. I mean, I'm kind of looking at this as though it's uh, tragic and unnecessary. And why, you know, why is the chair of the National Party putting us all through this, but especially the people of New Hampshire? So fair to say that your position would be cut them out, do the removal as quickly as possible, get it done and move on. Yeah, I I don't like to call for people's heads. I think that it's counterproductive, it's inflammatory, and it's frustrating. But I'm not really sure, like, where do you go from this point where you've got at least eight state parties who are saying that they don't want to participate in the CRM project, which the vice chair of the party has worked really hard on to get everyone on board and have access to the resources of national. So much faith has been lost in the national party across the country. That really sucks. Um, and what is like a big elephant in the room that no one ever talks about is that the chair doesn't keep his own officers apprised of what's going on. And that's, you know, I, I chair a really large affiliate. We've got around 250 active members in it. It's larger than most. Hold, hold on, hold on. Excuse me, Angela, for just a second. I, I want to address this. The, 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 I, I, I don't, I want to, like, like I said earlier, the super chat, we're going to put it on screen because it's a super chat. You want to, you want to trash talk anybody on the show for money? We you know our platform is for sale, obviously. Uh, but JBH favors mandatory vaccination. Is that true? I don't believe that. Is that somewhere that's that's is that that's got to be a joke? Because I mean, mm, citation, please. I I I want to stay away, like making fun of his name or the the superficial shit about his partner. You know, I that that's um, true. but I I wanted to. I, I I'm, I'm a like I'm I'm kind of. Like Steve and I are, are going to be, def I think we're the ones defending JVH in this conversation, at least as sort of no. devil's David advocate. Is neutral. Trying to David is trying to get in. Up right now. Okay, we might okay. get David back here. David. All right, well, without further ado, uh, as, with, with all due respect to everybody else involved in this conversation, let's bring on our heavyweight. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Ann Harlos, uh, someone who <laughs> is incredibly respected for her long term commitment to the party, her work. Uh, her character, her integrity. Uh, she is two-term national secretary of the LNC uh, and 
uh, secretary of the Libertarian Party of Colorado, um, and uh, whatever her official t head of the historic National Historical. <laughs> it was too much. So many t titles, titles, <laughs> formats. She's also a Game of Thrones fan. Um, yeah. But uh, titles, titles, titles yeah. Rallies, rallies, whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> she's got a collection of those. Uh, Karen Ann, I mean, the two big ones, a two term national secretary of the LNC. Any, anything else you want to include for credentials here, dear? No, <laughs> I'm not into okay. it. You know that. All right. Um, well, I, I mean, I almost don't know where to start. We have we have David who, who's trying to join us. We might have Daniel Hayes, and I'll say to the audience, we're not we're not being formal debate style. I'm not going to try to make this a debate. Yeah. This is this is this is more panel talk. Adam moderates a conversation. We want to mm -hmm. hear people advocating from all perspectives, and if someone wants to join us, uh, definitely David is invited. Or excuse me, uh, yeah, David Fight still welcome to join us. Um, and Daniel Hayes would be also very well. Oh, Daniel Hayes has the link in the email. Oh, and David is, is back. All right. So let's, let's get David on here. It might get a little crowded. Um, but we're, we're going to make sure that every perspective has a chance to say their piece. David fight is a New York state committeeman, which is uh, an official government position. I believe that he holds on behalf of the New York state libertarian party and is the outreach coordinator for the Libertarian Pragmatic Caucus. David, I apologize if there's any confusion on the timing. Greatly appreciate your flexibility in joining us. And uh, I think for, for uh, you know, joining us in the spirit of this as a conversation. Uh, David, do you have any I'm other credentials you'd like? Do you, thank you. Do you have any other credentials you'd like to include with your introduction? Um, no, you got it. I'm a New York State Committee member, and and I, I just actually the the outreach director for the Pride Caucus is a new thing, so this is uh this is a fun first uh, first couple of weeks as uh, as a national official for the Pride Caucus. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome to the party. Get let's uh, let's jump knee deep in the shit, shall we? All right. Yeah. This is this is not a pleasant situation. This is not a good thing. This is not mm. something we're like. You know, I mean, there, there are certainly people, you know, who have their factional motivations who are who are smiling about this, going, ah, oh, now my people get to take over, you know, enjoying the potential for a shakeup. But I, but overall, those of us who, who care about the party uh, certainly say this is this is unfortunate. Let's deal with this. Let's have a mature conversation. So on that note, let's turn to the lady with the funny hat and the pink hair uh, yeah. to lay out the facts. Uh, so, Karen Ann, if, if you would please, uh, the facts and just the facts, if we can handle the truth. Uh, how did we get to this point where this people, there's significant call on a petition for JBH to resign? You know, I did a whole two hour thing on this, so it's hard to do this um, in, a, in a brief form. So, uh, and, and brevity is obviously going to, to lose some very important things, but, but let me try to do this as briefly as possible. Apparently, JBH had been aware, as he says, for months, I think that's, he probably exaggerated that a bit because the, the convention was only in March, but you know, that, I guess that could have been months. Um, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt on that, that maybe he meant like a month or so of some kind of coming split, but that it wasn't for certain. And that's why he didn't bother telling the LNC about it, though. I would think a split in the state party, even if it was just a rumor, you should be telling your officers about it. Part of the problem in this party, and it's not just with JBH, it's when I, it's with our, his predecessor as well, is there's no officers. The chair is functionally a king. And that is not what the delegates think they're voting for. But besides that, so not breathing a word to the officers or the rest of the LNC, but I'm even just trying to make it as broad as possible. And we just met, um, a, what was it, a, last weekend. <laughs> God, it's it's a lot has happened. And New Hampshire was one of the topics. And he still didn't uh, breathe a word to one of the officers. And then on Monday, apparently... He was asked to author a certain letter for Gilletta. I informally interviewed Gilletta. And if you listen to that interview, it is not quite as stark as that. That according to Gilletta, they had been in discussions about what she might do for a little bit. So this wasn't just a, oh, call him on Monday. Oh, I'm going to ask you for this letter 
without any context because everyone goes, oh, the letter on its own isn't anything. The letter on its own doesn't exist on its own. It exists in a background context that either you were too completely dense to figure out what was going on, in which case you should not be chairing a national party, or you were complicit, in which case you should not be chairing a national party. There is no spin on this that makes JBH look good. And he did nothing afterwards to remediate it. So he wrote this letter to, to um, Gilletta Jarvis, who was the then chair of the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire, basically just affirming that the sky was blue, saying you are the chair of the of the only affiliate that we recognize in New Hampshire, which again, on its face is the sky is blue. Nothing controversial, right? No. But why? Like, why have asked that? If someone's going to ask me to write a sky is blue letter, I'm going to ask specifically why. And he says he didn't even ask why, that he had a guess in his head. Now, he sort of contradicts himself because at one point he says it's because she thought she might have issues getting control of the social media accounts. But then... He later says he didn't know why he guessed it was because of the social media accounts. Well, I'm sorry. If you think there's some big split coming and the chair all of a sudden wants some kind of official letter from you, you don't ask why. Okay, that Karen, is Karen, before, Karen, before we get to how this plays out, can you step back and cover the social media side of this narrative? Because I've heard that that was something important, that there were you know, racy edge lord type messages mm -hmm. going out because Mises members came in and at the last convention swept all the state officer positions except and 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 infamously also smacked down uh Sarwark by having Noda beat he him noted, in the yeah. race, right? Yeah. Listen, um, I wanna say something about that. I I don't like seeing anybody noted. That is absolutely humiliating and I don't like seeing anybody humiliated. He kind of stuck his though. foot. It is just, it doesn't mean I have to like it, but sure. he, he put himself into that position. You know, it isn't, I mean, but I still feel bad. I, well, there, if, 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 so Karen, if I, if I may just sidebar explain for the people who don't know, it is a libertarian, usually bylaw entrenched tradition that in it is. every election we have none of the above on the ballot. And that means that, that we always have the option of leaving a position unfilled. Nota is none of the above. So it means that we'd rather say, leave this position vacant than elect any of these people up there. So it's a rejection of people volunteering. And that was why it was such a major smackdown to the point of there. So no, I know I'm just this for people in my audience, Justin O'Donnell yeah. weighing in here, I believe at least one member of the new group has been conspiring this contingency for at least a few years because he was unhappy with radicals in charge back then. Okay, so Karen, back to your narrative, please, from this okay, letter sure. from JPH. But you wanted to know about this social media thing first, I thought. Please. Okay. Um, yeah, there were some there are some spicy hot takes coming out of New Hampshire. Um, I don't really want to get into it that much until we start talking about whether they violated some the statement of principles or something of that extent, because what New Hampshire tweets is none of the National Party's business. It just isn't. We The National Party has only one option when it comes to an affiliate that is offending its sensibilities, and that is to disaffiliate them. They otherwise cannot interfere in the autonomy of an affiliate. So when I think that will become more relevant later, but yeah, I think we can all admit there were some there were some spicy pepes, you know, if we want to use a, but they didn't actually use a pepe, but, you know, just to be funny. So, um, yeah, so he wrote this letter and now claims he didn't even ask what it was for, which I don't believe in a second because he's not stupid. But no matter which way you spin it, he, it, it it's incompetence or conspiracy. And then... Um, that Saturday, so he did the letter on Monday... During that week, Gilletta used that letter to busily start creating a new party or what was going to be the new party, a new organization that was also called the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. And JBH claims he doesn't really claim he didn't know she was doing that. He's never claimed that. He just claims, well, I wasn't a co-conspirator. That is, I don't. 
that wasn't the original. I didn't even think of that word till he said it. Um, that actually isn't. And I, I realize I used that a little bit here earlier, and I'm going to withdraw from that because that's probably stronger than I can prove. Um, but an accomplice in some way, or you know, a a witness in some way. Um, that knew what was going on because it's very, very difficult for me to believe that whole week. He did not know she was doing all of that. And she says he knows. And she said she was going to do the right thing and just resign. She was a chair who couldn't control her board. Obviously they couldn't work together. They outnumbered her. She was, had her resignation letter already written. And then someone whom she refuses to name, who I do not believe is JBH, by the way, um, came to her and said, there's another way. Oh, yeah, the coup way. Okay. For her to um, just unilaterally remove her board. And here's what's weird. JBH says she told him they constructively resigned. She said she never said any such thing and that she never considered them to have resigned, that she still considers them officers of the older party. And when I asked her, well, wouldn't that make you still an officer of the older party? When I interviewed her on that Saturday, I think the 12th, she stopped for a minute because I don't think she ever even considered that and said, well, I guess I am. <laughs> so she was now the officer of two libertarian parties of New Hampshire, but that really didn't occur to her till I like pointed that out. Mm -hmm. And um, so she she's using this letter. Then on Saturday, she announces, this is before I talked to her, her new organization and points to this letter as blessing from the national party. JBH never repudiated ever that she was wrong in her belief about that letter. He said everything but that. He could have nipped this on the bud on Sunday and said, I have sympathies for what's going on there. He could have still even did his motion to disaffiliate, but if he did not intend his letter to be used that way, he was incumbent upon him to immediately repudiate it. I love the example Dave Smith gave, where he said if he gave Robbie the Fire Bernstein a letter one day that says, you are the legitimate co-host of Part of the Problem, and then the next day, Robbie went out and started a new show called Part of the Program and started using that letter as proof that he had Dave's blessing to do it, and Dave yeah. said nothing for a week, you're either utterly incompetent or you did agree neither of them qualify you to continue to be chair you've completely lost the faith and trust of your board you can no longer lead this party um well, for, for the record karen and harlos is hereby officially a co-host of adam versus the man now the, the other thing you, you, a letter, i think that element of the story start a new one <laughs> Please do. Uh, this, this to YouTube to take over your channel. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know what? Actually, I, 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 this is so weird. I just got a text message from Gilletta right now, and I think I can read these on the. She's texting me while I'm on the air live, so I might as well. Oh, awesome. She says, "Okay, I will tell you two dates. I reached out to JBH on May 21 to ask him for help on how to deal with the situation." In New Hampshire, he did not get back to me. A third party got the letter for me, so I cannot speak to what JVH specifically knew or didn't know. I was not part of that discussion. On June 12, he reached out to me after who? everything had been done. Who? Was, me, J, who? She's referring to JVH, I think, here. No, no, who's June the 12, third party? Oh, maybe third party. Who? Yeah, she, where she says he he here, it could be the third. If she, Gillette, if you're watching... You, by the way, easier if you telegram me, I can read it from my laptop on the air. This is on June the thing. 12, Hold on, um, let me finish reading this. No, uh, on June 12th, he reached out to me after everything had been done and asked me what was going on and told me what he'd already he'd heard already. Some of what he... Uh, oh, there's more to this. Oh, geez. Uh, sorry, calmer on the topic than yesterday. So, um, can, I, I just... I want to make sure... Oh, maybe. I, I, just, I just want to make sure first that the narrative is complete. So, if we can focus on that. Uh, Karen Ann... What of the narrative 
do you feel needs to be added to, to get us up to today? Well, there's something I want to put out here that I put out all the time. Gilletta is a friend of mine. I hope she still considers me a friend of hers, even though we are on opposite sides here. I think she's a wonderful lady. I think she's being used, and I implore her to reveal who this person is that told her there is another way. It's that same third party, I'm sure, that got that letter. Now, JBH, I because it was never under question until right now, who got that letter, I think I need to hunt through some some voices and some things i think he claims that Gilletta herself asked him but i can't i don't have the receipts here i'm going by memory and i could be wrong but Gilletta's being set up for the fall and my heart bleeds for her because she's not a bad person i want to know who the puppet master is I'm not saying she's a puppet i'm using that word kind of hyperbolically but who is this third party because that's who's instigating it here and maybe jbh has taken a fall too that he shouldn't though i don't think so i really don't but there's another person at fault here who is instigating all of this and causing well, all of this it's really interesting in the that you say it that i lost you adam There he is. And now it's my connection. All right. You're back. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm trying. It's a while I'm trying to get this text message. From this is really crazy happening live time. Okay, Daniel is with us. Let's get Daniel up on stage. But what I want to do here is go around the panel real quick and just give everybody no interpretations, no judgments. What else do you feel needs to be said for this narrative to feel complete, Angela? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sitting at the Florida convention, and Michael Heist comes up to me and says big news shows me what's going on and he has to be the one to break the news to Ken Mullman and Karen Ann Harlow's. That's a real problem to not even have the other officers in the party know what the heck's going on and to be sending these kind of letters and dealing with affiliates on grave matters without keeping the other people who have the, you know, authority to make these sort of decisions in the know. So I think that's really important to note. Uh, there's a major problem at national when the chair doesn't communicate with who's supposed to be his right-hand man and the secretary. Okay. Uh, David, anything just on the narrative? I think you got yourself yep, muted I'm there. Muted. there you go. Uh, I definitely agree with, uh, with what Karen Ann just said, that, that there seems to be a puppet master behind this that's put up a few people for, for unnecessary falls. Honestly, I, I mean, I'm on here in the defense of JBH, but I'm not going to defend everything that happened there. And I'm definitely not going to defend anything that happened in New Hampshire. I think that that was completely egregious. But as far as um, just what happened goes, I think that there was a lot more conversations online and between people that didn't know what was going on than to Angela's point, then there was conversations between the people that did know what was going on. Misinformation spread extremely fast. And I it took days for me to to just even attempt to have a grasp on the situation and the actual true narrative. Uh, so it's uh, interesting to note that very few people have stepped up to defend JBH in this. And and like I said, I want to get a clear understanding of the narrative first, and then we'll come back to David to make the case for him not resigning, despite whatever you think he's he's responsible for in this. And it, it is, it, you know, I, I do want to there's play more, though, Adam. There's more, like, I didn't give the whole thing. And I'm glad you let Angela and other people come in, because I don't, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but there was a, there's more. So well, let me let me go to let me go to Steve next here. Steve, uh, do you feel that this narrative is complete? Do what what do you do you need to add or do you want to ask questions of the, the other panelists? So so I want to I want to call out some key points here, okay? So the first important thing to note is we have a he said she said scenario between JBH and Gilletta. We also have a letter that we now know was a third party request and resource which may be have been used or created 
to usurp JBH and Gilletta. Now, you know, there's there's some assumptions made to, to who might be behind the letter. Um, the, the, the important thing here to note is, is if there is a third party and a, a so-called puppet master, the, the understanding is if what in New Hampshire was so serious that the chair noticed or was somehow brought in by a puppet master, then how did no one else in New Hampshire reach out? That is my question. Right. Who else, yeah, so the, the, who else the, at that the, level knew that didn't speak up for themselves? Yeah, so there, there's an important benefit of the doubt angle there for JBH for us to consider that maybe he's being manipulated and he's just playing what he thinks of as his role as, you know, I got to stay neutral and who knows? Like, and then Karen, like, I've proved me wrong. This is me like, <laughs> oh, no, being right. skeptic and wanting to be like, really, really? Do we have to remove the chair? Like, come on. Is this Adam? Uh, Adam, come on. All right. Okay, okay listen. Okay, hold on. Care. Don't worry, Karen Ann. You, we, we got, we still got, you know what? I'll tell you, know what? I'm going to tell you guys on, on this panel, just so everybody knows that they're going to have their piece heard. We're, we're not going to cut the show at, at 10 a.m. in 23 minutes. Um, I will at least give everyone here a full five minute closing statement if you want. So if you want to make notes, anything that you feel is left out of this, I respect you all. I want you all to feel heard in this. Uh, Rich Clark weighing in for 4.99 super chat. Much of the misinfo spread due to JBH taking his own sweet time to officially respond. Yeah, yeah so it's it's yeah. it's hard to avoid. There, there, it, it, if this narrative all holds true, it, it's it certainly seems unavoidable to the the, the charges of incompetence. Uh, I believe Daniel Hayes is back again. Maybe having connection issues. If we can get him up while I'm reading uh, this text I've got from Gilletta now, I got the whole thing. Okay, I will tell you two dates. I reached out to JBH on May 21 to ask him for help on how to deal with the situation in New Hampshire. He did not get back to me. A third party got the letter for me, so I cannot speak to what JBH specifically knew or didn't know. I was not part of that discussion. On June 12, he reached out to me after everything had been done and asked me what was going on and told me what he'd heard already. Some of what he'd heard was in his statement regarding his conversation with me but were not things I had said. I don't know who gave him the other information, but now those things are being attributed to me incorrectly. There is nothing more I can say about what he did or did not know. So yeah, it, it definitely seems like Gilletta is, is being manipulated and set up, but I think I would want from her a statement a little more decisive as well. And, and maybe she's afraid of some legal culpability with funds or equipment being moved. And I can certainly give her the benefit of the doubt on that for now. And I appreciate her, uh, Gillette, if you're listening, I appreciate you sending this to me during the show right now. Uh, Daniel Hayes joins us. Daniel, you've been introduced and credentialed as longtime Louisiana LP activist and organizer of conventions extraordinaire. Do you have uh, anything you want to weigh in on, uh, on, on the narrative first or uh, your position on this? I want to see the dog. Um, he's, he's not available. Daniel, you're but upset. anyhow, sorry, Karen. Um, can y'all hear me? Mm. Anyway, okay, so I'll use my noted <laughs> loud voice. Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay, so, um, gotcha. you know, some things that uh, a lot of people have been talking about, um, you know, I, I think there's some attempts at six level chess going on yeah. here. Um, six level chess, right? Who's the six level chess players? I don't know. I don't know who that might be. Some people have been extraordinarily silent in a state they live in, maybe. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. um, something, you know, in, in like Karen Ann, I'm, a, I'm something of a parliamentarian, been a, been a, the state treasurer uh, of my, uh, unit of the National Association of Parliamentarians, whatever. I, I run around with that formerly big brown book and now I got a digital version of the 12th. But anyway, um, you know, something, some people run around and they say, well, we just need to uh, take the assets away from both sides. Well, I don't think there's really much of a question as to what entity is and should be in control. They had a convention. People were elected there. That's the entity that should have whatever assets, etc., restored to them. Who's on that board? That was decided largely at that convention, so that shouldn't be in question. Um, the fact that JBH can't go there, can't 
get to that particular point that credentials were given to the chair who went off and admittedly on that video Karen Ann did uh, with her and, and, and with other LC members, uh, many of them in tow, um, it, it's been admitted. The old entity still exists. This is a new entity. Well, you know, the, the bylaws are clear. There can only be one. There can only be one. And there was already an existing affiliate. So until such time as that affiliate was disaffiliated, you cannot have another entity come in. Um, so, you know, giving JBH the benefit of the doubt, and by the way, for, for disclosure, I think all caucuses um, of these factional sorts suck. And if, if anybody remembers, I'm, I'm the guy that Mises caucus accused of kicking Ron Paul out of the party. So keep that in mind. But, um, you know, so in JBH's defense, uh, you know, he is putting up a motion to disaffiliate the party only has power to affiliate or disaffiliate since uh, since since that uh entity exists uh, and that's they don't have an actual power to reaffiliate or affirm that's not really in the in the in the powers of the lnc but they can disaffiliate and it takes a three-fourths vote the chances of that passing are really slim so it could potentially be argued that he's taking the only legal motion he can by this attempt to disaffiliate to clear the matter up can be argued that way um so you know it's as everybody said it's a total freaking mess um but but there's some things that are really clear and people are basically on par their, their partisan lines of their caucuses instead of looking at the basic indisputable facts that a convention was had, that people were elected at that convention, and uh, that convention was put on by the long-term affiliates, so therefore that entity should be con in control and given whatever benefits the National Party provides to affiliates. And if, that, if they're such bad boys, then... They sh there should be official proceedings to disaffiliate, um, not, and not an email. That, I mean, fr frankly, that's something that shouldn't be done in email. That's where, where the disaffiliation motion is, which is why I think there's maybe some credence that this is just kind of a rubber stamp to say, okay, here's, here's official action that we can take as to who the affiliate is. Anyway, I'll shut up. All right, well, thank you, with? Daniel. Speaking speaking of caucuses, oh, Angela apparently is rescheduling something so she can stay with us. Um, David, back to you on this. In terms of this, the, the crux of this being JBH responsible for the the doing the disaffiliation on his own. Uh, how do you stand? How, how, what what is your take on that specific charge? It seems like that's the bit. I mean, there's a lot of little ones. There's stuff around this. There's incompetence. There's that poor handling. And I think even defending JBH, you would admit to plenty of that. But mm -hmm. the crux of the critical charge here is that he unilaterally basically disenfranchised the officer corps of the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire in order for Gilletta, who was chair already, to be chair of a new one and basically get rid of her whole board and and repopulate it with people that she wanted and and who knows who else wanted mm -hmm. david so i i don't remember who said it earlier but the somebody said that that we've got a pretty bad he said she said case going on right now and and when that happens it's it's very difficult to actually get to the bottom of you know you're reading off uh the the text from Gilletta that disagree with other things that we've heard and and there have been a lot of that going on i saw the comment earlier uh from from one of your viewers that jbh is uh t taking his sweet time it, uh, definitely contributed to that misinformation and i'll agree there uh he ch i from what i saw and and what i conversed with with him and some of the people around him at the very beginning of this was you know he was attempting to to take the the principled national party stance of like trying to stay out of it for a minute and see what happened and uh i saw i saw a lot more uh calls for his resignation before i saw anything from him so i mean there were there were people all over the place in the twitter sphere and on facebook and and in email threads and i've i've seen some of the emails um and i'm sure you know karen ann you've 
like to to show some of those screenshots and those are always fun of the emails that you guys get at the lnc yeah uh <laughs> um there was there was a decisive push that i saw to put jbh into this situation while he was trying to stay out of it now whether or not he actually was behind the scenes doing the things that people are telling him to do um or you know or telling other people to do things that's that's still part of the the he said she said i why was the rest of the board not informed though that is a good question i don't i can't answer that question i yeah so, if so, i was so him David, that would have been the case. so david is, is it fair to say that even taking the position at, as much as possible in defense of jbh in this situation that this would call for uh, a convening of the Judicial Committee or the LNC to examine it, and that if he doesn't explain stuff, if he doesn't answer some of these basic questions, that he should be held to account both for the, the secrecy element of it, uh, you know, and then that, that if this is the intervention, that there should be some judgment on this, and that if it was decided that this is what happened and, and he's given that due process, that he should resign? Or, or be removed? Yeah, I, I think Dan said that uh, about the, the drawing party lines, I'm not I'm not gonna do that here. And, and I've seen that a lot in this situation. Yes, I am part of the same caucus that JBH is, but he's not my Donald Trump. He's not somebody that I'm just going to defend every action of unilaterally. And, and because I'm defending him as a person doesn't mean that I'm defending his actions. Definitely doesn't mean that I'm defending Gillette's actions. It does, very, very much doesn't mean that I ever defended Nick Sarwark's actions. They like to get lumped together a lot, which drives me nuts. So yeah, I mean, if we find out that he's in the wrong here, if the judicial committee does their job and he isn't able to explain himself and the, the LNC decides that they no longer want him as the chair, that's how political parties work, 100%. Uh, then then he should be removed if he's able to explain himself and and the we're able to get down to the facts or it's still just a, a really murky he said she said then i think it's a le lot less clear of a of a call and i think that jbh has done enough work as the chair and is continuing to do enough work as the chair that this this situation is not enough the like just the murkiness and the bullshit of this situation isn't enough for me to want to see him leave so but it but it should be examined and resolved as quickly 100%. as possible and, and if he if jbh doesn't participate in that openly and enthusiastically to regain your confidence there that's that would would cause you to to, to flip on this and say he should be removed right yeah something like yeah i mean it's somewhat subjective I also I also would respect his decision to to resign, not out of guilt, but out of just um, avoiding the conflict. Uh, yeah, avoiding the clusterfuck. Like, like that, that whether well, whether there's any ill intent or criminal intent or what have you, that it might be the right thing for him to do. That to say, hey, I'm sorry, I created a mess that I'm responsible for and affiliated with, and. and Unentangled, un unavoidable way, and I should have resigned to avoid it. That might be the right thing. So, thank you for pointing that out. So, let's get divisive for a minute here. Uh, let's talk about caucuses that that uh, Daniel hates. Uh, so, Angela, yeah, you know we're going to Mises here. And yeah, but I, remember know, gotta... to come back to me, Adam, because you said oh. you would let me finish, and you never let me finish. Oh, okay. We want to finish the narrative. Well, let's get let's get the Mises part of the narrative, and then we'll let Karen Ann round that out before we get to everybody's judgments and opinions and analyses. So my disclosure on Mises is that I'm I'm one of the original Facebook. Oh, and the chair just threatened members. to sue me, by the way, over this. I just he just threatened to sue oh. me for defamation, and I said, go ahead. Oh, wow. Well, and I, the chair now. of the party is threatening to sue one of his officers for questioning him. Let what? that sink in. Can you read us the the so this is text yeah. message, Karen Ann? Can you no, read it's, us it's, the, it's the, on the it's on, on the on. business list. I'll read you the whole thing. This Please. this is this is outrageous. Okay. So during here, I put in a title. I just learned that letter was not given by JBH to Diletta, which might have been a little imprecise, but I then went on to say, 
who was the third party who procured the letter, okay? And Joshua said something and I said, well, I'm asking the chair. And he said, false, I emailed it directly to Ms. Jarvis, which does not appear to be what she said, but there could be a little wiggle room there. Any right. member of this board spreading further false claims about my integrity or actions be on notice that you may face personal liability for defamation. Using the assets of the organization to disseminate false claims, which he's done about me, by the way, too, also places the organization's legal position in jeopardy and members should be more circumspect in their assertions and statements under authority of their position. I asked him a simple question. I made no accusations i asked him a question and i said you are a public figure and this information was just stated publicly by ms jarvis on a recording there is zero liability for defamation when there is good faith questioning and are you seriously threatening to sue an officer for investigating you go ahead and let me be precise she did not wow. ask you for the letter another obtained it that does not preclude you emailing it to her. She says that she didn't ask you for it or talk to you about it, contrary to your statements. Unreal. He's trying to yeah. bully me through legal actions into shutting up? No, thank yeah. you. Not today, Satan. Yeah, no, Karen Ann, I, thank you for, I mean, this is really interesting how this is playing out in real time right now. Um, thank you for your patience, everybody else. That was absolutely worthwhile. But now there's more. You know that 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 just happened, but the rest hold I wanted on, to say hold, earlier. Hold yeah, Karen, I want I want to point out that that would be enough for me to ask a Libertarian National Chair to resign right there. Threatening threatening legal action for like there's not nobody is if some like the only way that's remotely appropriate if, if is if someone else is going like accusing him of crimes outside of these appropriate channels and and trying to get the police called on him because this is like the equivalent of him going you know i'm going to call the police when there's no justification or being the first one at a poker game to pull out a, a pistol like this is the this is absolutely fucking inappropriate to throw because nothing you are doing nothing anything i've heard anybody doing questioning jbh or even accusing him even the actual accusations <clears throat> are all in the realm of performance as chair professional lane, appropriate conversations, appropriate criticisms. No one is trying to get the government involved or called into JVH. For him to turn around and call the government or threaten to call the government that directly as to threaten legal action for defamation against Karen Ann Harlos or anybody else on the LNC for anything I've heard so far. To me, I would say, you know, and I would understand if I got beaten on this vote, but I would demand the LNC determined that that's what was happening he wasn't under duress at the time he's responsible for it he should be removed just for that karen Ann, anything anything else immediate you have to you have to report yeah no i i, I do there's other things i wanted to finish on that first um statement and remember that Gilletta, when she got this letter now she might not have gotten this impression directly from jbh though you know sometimes you skip steps when you're talking to people like you skip intermediate steps. She told me in the interview that she was under the understanding that this letter was a transfer of affiliation. That doesn't mean JBH told it to her. It could be this third party. But that's how it was communicated and that's how she used it. She's really being set up here. Gilletta, you're my friend. Please give up the name and save yourself. But yeah, besides... I, I, I yeah, Karen, and I was coming to the same conclusion that that someone is well. You you can't. I, I would I would say Gillette is in the position to 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 spill the beans from the middle and and really resolve this. I think yeah, a lot of she's people being used. Back. She's but being used she, badly, and, I'm, right. and I know and people was, will yell at me and say, "Oh, she's yeah, she is responsible for your own actions." But you know, people can whisper in your ear and get you. I don't even want, but she. She needs to not take the fall for something that somebody else is is instigating for their for their for their own benefit. Absolutely, and it, for Toletta, when she watches this, I, I would say I share that sentiment and I empathize with the, with the fact that you may be under some other duress that you're not able to share with us at this point. Yeah, maybe she's and, afraid of something. There's been threats going on here, 
Yeah. So maybe she's yeah. afraid. I don't know. But she did consider that a transfer of affiliation. And now everyone, it's like they gave her they gave her the grenade with the pin already pulled. And now everyone's running away from the blast radius and leaving her. And that's not right. But what I was going to go on to say about why the chair should resign before he even started threatening to sue me is in his subsequent conversations, he made it clear that he is at war with other libertarians. Um, Angela put this quote um, up in chat before, but um, I'm going to see if I could find it. It says right here, um, the reality is that our party faces a binary choice between two very different visions and some very different mutually exclusive principles. That's, I'm not going to read the whole paragraph because that sums it up well. He has basically had says, there are two different parties going on here and their principles are mutually exclusive. I don't feel that way. If he feels that way, he's actually saying certain people do not belong in this party and that they need to go. And you cannot be a chair and yeah, say shit like saying. that. Yeah. He needs to go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Angela, we need to get Angela uh, a chance to weigh in here. So Angela... Hold on, I want to I want to give one of these problems I have with these caucuses is all the purge mentality. I keep getting cut off. I'd love to get a point in. Daniel, Daniel, I'm turned up. Angela, 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 that one, that one, Angela. Thanks. <clears throat> one of the things that's so frustrating about this, and I think that David David's going to feel me on this, is you know one of the things that JBH said in his letter is that the there's an element in the party, a large element, that is trying to destroy the party. And the optics of that, well, that that on its face is pretty rude. <laughs> the optics of it is that, you know, half of us are evil, that we want to hurt the party, that it doesn't matter all the growth we've made, that it doesn't matter that a lot of us have worked really hard to build bridges with people in the radical caucus especially, but also in the pragmatist caucus and people who are not in caucuses and people who are, you know, single issue minded. Um, I don't understand how you can chair a national movement when you think half the people in your party are evil. I think that that's a really bad take. Um, and, I, you know, I'd love to hear from anyone else who, who thinks otherwise. But I got to tell you, as someone who works my ass off to get along with everyone who's reasonable, I can't control people who hate my guts, right? But to, to get along with other people who are reasonable and want to advance the cause of liberty, I'm not really sure, you know, like what what place do I have in a party where the person who's heading it up thinks that I'm evil? That really sucks. And if I were to get elected and call half the party a bunch of blue pill cucks, well, people would be rightfully calling for my head. And so I think we're just seeing the reverse of this right now. And it's really poor leadership. Uh, and I just don't know how we recover from this. So I, I'm curious to hear some thoughts on that. Okay, no, that's a, that's a great segue. I wanted to get to that next. You know, what would we like to see happen as a way of addressing this? And, you know, David touched on it with, with you know, if we could get this, just that we want this examined, that there's no way around this. But I would I would go uh, to Karen Ann again and then and then to Daniel to answer that question specifically procedurally what do you want to happen next um and sorry all of a sudden now there's an accusation that nine messages were deleted from the lnc list i didn't delete anything that was so, that comment uh, with justin o'donnell tipping you off on screen there yeah wow. i have no idea what that's about i deleted nothing so I I'm hoping. If you gotta stop, hey, Karen, Ann, if you gotta stop and take screenshots, take screenshots. No, that's okay. It'll be in everybody's email boxes. I think Ms. Epke uh, is confused. Okay. I think she's confused. I I don't think there's anything going on. But I was like, what? And now I'm being accused of deleting emails. Great. Now she wasn't accusing me. That's that, that was uncharitable. Now I'm being asked if I deleted emails. I do have that power. So it's completely fair for her to ask me. That was uncharitable <laughs> um, to say uh, accusation. Um, but I think she's confused. And I deleted nothing. I've never deleted things. I offered this morning when a minor's um, contact information, Tucker accidentally leaked it to the LNC list. I was in bed. I wasn't near a computer. So I said, 
I would have deleted that if I were by a computer, but I wasn't. I th and staff did that. But staff can delete emails too. I deleted nothing. And I don't think I've ever deleted an email from the email list in the four years I've been secretary. Um, but I do have that power. Um, but I can't delete from people's personal email boxes. They still exist there. So procedurally, what I'd like to see done. Um, I'm going to say something that's going to seem like a criticism against the LNC, but it's not. It's just a criticism against boards in general. They never or very rarely remove anybody. It's just human nature. They just don't do it. Um, I would love to see a motion to remove him pass. I don't think there's the three-fourths vote, but I do think there is more than a majority, which means that he should in good faith resign because he's lost the faith of more than the majority of the board that he needs to have in order to do his job. So procedurally, I wish he would just make it easy and resign. But if he doesn't resign, I believe we do have the votes and the support for a motion to censure with a resolution at the end of it with the people voting for the censure asking him to resign. That would be pretty powerful to be on the record. But that's really all that can be done. Um, I think the right thing for him to do is just simply resign and spare everyone this. And he doesn't need to admit to any vote. kind of you guilt or go, fault. You basically go straight to an LNC vote on. Yes, but I would rather what? he just resign. And I don't think anyone's looking for a pound of flesh that would make him sure. in his resignation admit to anything. If that if that's how it happens, and he either resigns or is removed with a simple vote, what happens next? Um, that hasn't... I don't, I, I don't exactly know, to be honest with you. What I think would happen is that the LNC vice chair would serve as chair until the LNC elected a new chair because we fill our own vacancies. I don't think he automatically becomes vice chair. Um, I've got to look into that. So there's two possibilities. Either the vice chair automatically becomes chair and then we fill the vacant vice chair or the vice chair temporarily serves as chair and we fill the vacant chair. It's only one of those two things. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, Daniel, did you have thoughts on the yeah, procedure so or how you'd want to see this addressed? What, what Karen was just talking about, uh, the, the latter is the way it works for the LNC. I was actually looking at the bylaws this morning. Um, uh, the, the vice chair he... would fill in, um, but in, in the case of the LNC, uh, the vice chair does not automatically become the, the permanent chair. So the LNC fills vacancies, and um, I, I'm not sure if um, what the status of the the online meetings are that the LNC has. If they're uh, regular meetings or special meetings, but if they're special meetings, your special meeting has has to be focused on the reason the meeting's called for. So you know. Uh, there would probably be some delay, and there probably should be some delay before someone was put in as a permanent chair um, so that, you know, the members could consider the options, that being the members of the LNC. Uh, the regional reps could hear from their constituencies as to how they want them to vote, and, uh, you know, that needs to go on. I, I know there has been one resignation already um, with the Region 8 rep has stepped down, and, you know, I'm not in Region 8. But I would encourage uh, the state chairs and whoever it is, as per their regional agreement, that uh, appoints their their uh, their new regional rep. I'd like them to consider someone, quote unquote, nonpartisan with one of these caucuses, because you know the caucus wars are getting really silly. The national bylaws say that uh, the 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 party is supposed to stay separate and distinct from all other political parties and movements. And, uh, you know, I think there's... See, the, these other caucuses are getting into being other movements beyond, you know, the Libertarian Party. And, and, and so people need to keep that in mind, at least the spirit of that particular bylaw, as they're moving forward. All right. Well, that's a perfect segue. I want to go back to Angela on that, because there is... Uh, an elephant in the room here of the Mises Caucus, of which I am one of the founding Facebook group when that was all there was members having then been kicked out of that. 
uh, feeling like the prodigal son in California with the wonderful time we had with Mises there. Uh, I, I've enjoyed watching uh, various exploits of the Mises Caucus organization around the, the New England area recently. So uh, Northeast, it's all New England to me. Yeah, I'm Southwest. You know, fuck all that cold Northeast part of the country. Uh, miserable people and miserable weather. Uh, but aside from that, uh, yeah, LP, we love we love regional shit talking here. So like, I, I I I don't get to do the military thing anymore. So this is my substitute. Uh, but no, Mises clearly had a role in what happened in New Hampshire. You've been involved, and and some people are saying that that you need to get away from that to to be a unifier for chair. Uh, can you at least, I know, give, give it, feel free to give us both of those points. You know, what is your relationship? How do you see the role of the Mises Caucus? But also, what is your take on Mises' involvement in this episode leading up to New Hampshire specifically? Okay, what's my role and what's my take? Well, my role is I'm on the National Mises Caucus Board, and I chair the California Mises Caucus. We're our own PAC, and I'm one of the California organizers. So I'm I'm very involved, and I'm very committed. And I understand there are other people who think you shouldn't be in a caucus when you're in a position of national leadership. I totally get it. It would be completely disingenuous of me for if, it is, for if I were to say, oh, I quit it all. That, that would be, I'm an honest, transparent person. So it is what it is. Uh, I'm probably not going to be chairing it or being on a board anymore because I don't think legally I could do that if I were to get elected. So that's where I, that's, you know, where I stand on that. Um, I think it's possible to be unifying without quitting a caucus uh, if you're willing to actually work with other people. And the people who think that I am a racist, fascist, Nazi, transphobe, mm -hmm. long list of insults, they're not gonna work with me if I just say, oh, I quit the Mises caucus. That's not gonna happen. And I don't believe that any of those insults are genuine. So, mm -hmm. you know, you Go. can be unified. Great point. Now, regarding New Hampshire, yeah, absolutely. The, the Mises Caucus played a role in the New Hampshire board. They did not actually control every single seat, though. And I think that that's getting confused in the optics of this situation. And, you know, Jeremy Kaufman, the guy who made the controversial tweets, is in the Mises Caucus Facebook group, which does not actually equate actual membership or that we have any control over what he does. He's just someone that many Mises Caucus people had previously been, you know, friends and allies with. And that relationship is obviously undergoing a lot of turmoil right now. And I don't know whether or not the the guys in New Hampshire have, have, oh, have disavowed him or if they're just like, chill out. But have we been trying to tone it down and rein that in? Yeah, absolutely. You think I'm really happy about seeing the Arvin 2.0 try to, you know, <laughs> get associated <laughs> with my chair race? Ugh. No, um, and to whatever extent we can clean that up, you know, and, and exert, you know, some friendly uh, pressure from the national level, absolutely we're gonna do that. But I'm not gonna be someone who's like a dictator tyrant who tells an affiliate, you can do this or you can't do that, you know? And if you don't, you're just ruining my life. That's not appropriate either. You gotta have a lighter touch with those sort of things. So everyone who's screaming on the internet right now for me to just do something, like. I'm not going to do something unilaterally, same as JBH shouldn't have sent that message, that letter out unilaterally. What we do need to do in the Mises Caucus, though, is use better judgment with who we give the keys to with social media, which is a big, big thing, you know, for me, because I really, I think messaging is really important, you know, and I don't want to jump from one end of the spectrum to the opposite end where we've gone from watered down, milk toast, boring messaging to just shit posting edgelord stuff. There's got to be a happy medium, and I hope that people will work with me on that in the caucus and out. So one more thing I want to ask for your take on specifically in this, Angela, is the significance of Mises almost sweeping the uh, New Hampshire Libertarian Party officer elections and sort of choosing to get behind uh, Gilletta rather than uh, put up a competitor but rather just focus on everything else and have the majority of the board. Why is that important to the Mises caucus? And, and why do some people see this as a hostile takeover? I imagine that they chose not to run someone against Gilletta for the same reason that I didn't 
comb the roster looking for someone to run against Mimi Robson in California. If you don't have someone qualified to do the position, you should not run them. You know, there are, there are positions that you can train people for. You, I can, I train a lot of people on Robert's rules of order and how to participate in executive committee meetings, how to take minutes, all kinds of things. Right. Uh, but it's completely different training someone how to chair an affiliate. And so I just recommend that people proceed with caution on, on chair and on treasurer. And I imagine that the New Hampshire guys probably felt the same way. And, you know, it's not my intention and it's not the intention of anyone else that I respect in the Mises caucus to literally run everyone out. It's that we think that we need better leadership and messaging. It's not to purge people from the LP. There's honestly two or three people I would really like to see leave. Same as with everyone, but half the party or everyone who's a Prague caucus person or caucus list, like, come on, that's ridiculous. I don't want that. Neither does Michael Heiss. Ne neither does the Mises caucus board. And I don't have control over what, you know, some shit posting edgelords who are in our Facebook group say occasionally, like, you know, I can't, I can't like rein in every person on the internet. What an absurd thought. Those are my thoughts All right, for, well, let's give uh, David a, a minute to respond here as a rep of the Prague Caucus. And before before you do, I, I, I do want to say that there is uh, a, a destructive dynamic in the divisiveness among caucuses. And it's nice to note that Angela and David are personal friends and represent, I think, the best of what's possible here, where they provide gateways for people into the party who have certain concerns that they want voiced or represented or activism that they want prioritized. And I think that's great and that they're able to talk and have this conversation. So the divisiveness is often a very artificial, stupid one based on false understandings of the ideology and misinterpretations. Whereas we all want to pull together to achieve a voluntary society because we have all checked the box by becoming members of the libertarian party avowing that we will not we condemn any acts of force or aggression or violence in pursuing political goals and that we want to see nothing less than a world set free in our lifetime what i would call the voluntary society described in the party's statement of principles that we all champion uh andrew aj olding also new hampshire state lp activist with a two dollar super chat weighing in, Justin O'Donnell for LPNH chair. I love this. Adam versus the man is now the ultimate advertising platform Adam. for, for future uh, for future in, internal campaigns. Right? Okay. Uh, it might be too late. Um, I don't know if you want to keep going on this, but uh, Elijah is really just that he would argue on behalf of JBH if. He wanted, if you guys want, if we wanted him to come on. He thought well, he just saw the post. Okay, we'll have, tomorrow. You know what? We'll, we'll we'll have some follow up interviews on this. As to what depending, yes, to. I would also be extremely curious as to Elijah's take on this, but it'll have to wait till next week. Adam versus the man. Friday tomorrow, we're still doing good news, cutting edge, happy, positive stuff. It's amazing. We got a lot of we got UFOs. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> tease tomorrow's show. We got right. puppies. We got kittens. We got space exploration. We got all sorts of high tech shit. Indeed. It's like we got we we got can of we got uh, what COVID vitamins, um, smokable form, um, all sorts of fun stuff that we have we do every Friday on this show. Uh, but David, I want to give you the uh, what I want to do is give David a chance to 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 say his piece on what's been covered so far. Then uh, a quick round of possible rebuttals, and then and then go to closing arguments uh, before we go too much longer on this. So. David. All right. Uh, so first thing I wanna I wanna address because I I agree with with everything that Dan said about about caucuses. I hate them. I I was caucus unaffiliated up until uh, early in the year. I joined the Pride Caucus because I had a long conversation with multiple members of the board that they weren't going to partake in this ideological bullshit and this civil war, and that all that they were going to focus on was uh, winning elections. When I joined the caucus, uh, there was some people in the caucus that didn't want me there because I was, at the time, friends with multiple people in the Macy's caucus and very friendly with Dave Smith and very friendly with Angela and a couple other people. I had actually just had Angela on the show maybe like two weeks prior to me joining the caucus. Um, 
but they want like the people on the board wanted me there because they wanted to end this the civil war they did or not end it just not partake in it they didn't want anything to do with this that's the only reason that i joined that specific caucus and still stayed out of the other ones that i could join uh, i mean i ideologically agree with both the mises and the radicals almost 100 percent. i could be a part of them but i didn't want to be a part of an ideological caucus um i want to respond first to something angela said uh the last time she talked uh you said that you would work with everybody except for the ones that hate you. And I feel like JBH is probably in a similar situation. He, from the second he uh, he got the endorsement of the former chair, who he was running against, he wasn't some hand-picked successor, he was running against the former chair and then got that endorsement. He has been getting death threats and libel and slander and bullshit piled up from a large wing of the party claiming that he doesn't do anything that he you know you already used the term blue pill cuck i know uh sarcastically but I, i've heard that describing him since the day he got elected um mm. and then and then there was a race against him within a few months before he was even able to actually hire his staff and perform the job of chair for a few days there was already a concerted race against him for his seat and there was a large faction of the party championing that and and not in the nice way that Angela has been conducting her race, but in the destructive tear down mentality of JBH is a piece of shit that doesn't belong as chair long before any of this started. So I don't necessarily, I don't like the fact that he got drawn into this caucus divide. I have had multiple conversations with him and other people on his staff trying to talk them out of getting dragged into this because it's it's hard it's hard to stay out of it when there's one group of people that loudly hate you and another group of people that loudly support you it's difficult to not put on a team jersey um and i respect tell his... me about it <laughs> <laughs> right right um and i respect his his ability to actually try to stay out of it for a decent chunk of it and uh, you know, it's been it's been a little over a year now of him being chair, and he's he's tried to keep his hands clean from what I've seen, and sometimes that's pissed me off, and other times that's made me respect him more than I respect myself. Um, to what Dan said about um, about the Region Eight rep, that actually makes me really sad because I'm in Region Eight, and Tucker Coburn is one of my best friends in the party, and I respect him a lot, and I also consider him to be one of the best people at just putting his head down, doing the work, and not being a part of this bullshit. Uh, and I think that that's a problem that the Prag Caucus has when it comes to optics, is that the majority of the people in our caucus that are out there doing the work aren't on social media, aren't defending themselves. The narrative is set around our caucus by keyboard warriors, and we don't have many of them in the caucus. We have like three, and one of them I despise with a burning passion. And so <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for, for us to even defend ourselves when we're just outnumbered like 200 to one. And I'm not even being hyperbolic because that's when I get into these arguments on, on Twitter, that's about the number that it seems like. Uh, Stop arguing with sock puppets. Right. <laughs> uh, but let's get this on the record. David Fight, you're the bomb. You're just the bomb, okay? Thank you. You've been such a good sport in this whole thing, and I love you. I love you, too. I'm. Oh. Despite what I said earlier, I'd give David my ador endorsement from it as an outsider, maybe, to fill that seat. Because, you know, I'd say stay away from caucus people, but he seems like he's, you know, un you know willing to not just always tow that partisan line. Mm -hmm. yeah, All right, well, I, I, I gotta, I gotta address one thing you said there, David, that that I would refute as a point in JBH's defense, uh, where you said he he wasn't a handpicked successor because Sarwark was running against him. He was he dropped out. Do you really? You you're backing that up, Karen Ann? That wasn't that wasn't all staged because I've seen and you know. And I was there. I watched enough you, of those meetings hey, with hey. Sarwark's squirrely shit. Where I go, you, I if, if you get his endorsement, I'm probably not voting for you. Okay, I predicted JBH running for chair a year before he did because I saw Sarwar grooming him. And I can point you to the email list where I publicly said this. 
He is a groomed successor. No, or that, or I'm a fucking prophet. And I'm not a prophet. Yeah, right. God no, has I, not anointed yeah, me. So so no, I want, but I want to underscore one other thing you said, David. That like we all catch a lot of shit, and as Ernie Hancock would say, nothing on the internet is real. Don't feed the trolls, you know, or at least. Daniel you know, remembers me skin. saying that. Don't you, Daniel? Yeah. You were you were on the LNC when I said that. You know, I don't specifically right, remember so, though. Okay. All right. So I do. All right. People in place six level chess. JDH made. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of multi-layered manipulation and never forget that we are up against the old parties, not just the whole government racket and establishment, but directly against the old parties that have multi hundred million dollar annual budgets and they are going to use it to infiltrate, to deceive, to sabotage to have trolls in our audiences, in our comment sections, in our Facebook groups, uh, on Twitter. And even with all of this, I have to wonder if the whole thing isn't a distraction because right now it feels like the whole Libertarian Party is watching the spectacle because it deserves to be watched. What's the other hand doing? Who knows? There could be some other whole layer to this that we don't even see right now while we're paying attention to this. Super chat, free men die free for $20. The Kaga survive goes back to a decade from the Sarwark faction attacking Ron Paul era libertarians and disenfranchising them for a decade. Most of us know Sarwark took the LP hard left and LP messaging reflects that. Interesting historical insight there. Thank you for that. I love how Star Wars sir. took the party hard left, but also gets shit on for running a Republican for president. At the same time. <laughs> a leftist Republican for president. Bill Weld is barely a Republican. Well, I don't know what the All fuck. Right, was, was a a I am going to intervene as I am going to intervene as moderator here <laughs> to keep this on topic and get everybody out at a reasonable time. So I'm going to we're going to go to closing statements now. That's it. No more interaction. <laughs> closing statements. Everybody, please respect. The last words. I, I'll go to Steve first, because Steve, I assume you have the least to say. Uh, are, are you happy with how this has gone? Are, are there any big gaps for you still in this conversation? Uh, so, so I, I think the main thing here is there's there's still. I mean, outside of the new relevant information that was emailed threatening to sue uh, LNC board members. Um, Prior to that, uh, a lot of this situation is assumption based, is circumstantial, and as he said, she said, you know, we're we're assuming that uh, JBH knew the intent of a mystery third party, right? We don't know that, you know, unless that gets disclosed, we're not going to know that. Now, the best path forward, regardless, um, because of the delay of him resolving the situation. It's probably for him to resign and not drag this out any further. Uh, that being said, you know, I took I, I took this on at the last minute to try and help David fight out. I am I am a Mises member, right? So uh, for me, remaining as objective as possible, I've been following the public email for the last almost week now, and you know, circumstantially, I think I think the evidence is a lot of is based on a lot of assumptions. We, we, there are just things we don't know. And unless Gilletta or JBH feel, feel compelled to sort of testify to a judiciary or XCOM board, uh, we aren't gonna know. And it's best if the situation is, is resolved as quick as possible. And I think, unfortunately for JBH, he, he may have done some good things for the party, but at this point he has harmed the party's reputation down through many state affiliates. I know as a candidate, I, I distrust the LNC right now. And that is indicative of uh, just the assumptions being made and, and the way the circumstantial evidence looks. So so I would vote that, that he just takes the initiative and resigns. All right, thank you. Daniel? So, um, you know, one thing I wanna point out that I just remembered, um, about JBH and in a probable unintended consequence of this whole situation, a lot of people have lost faith 
in the CRM. Um, you know, and that's something that I've been very supportive of. My last action on the LNC was to fully fund the CRM, and uh, then that money got spent on other things. But I digress. But jump to 2019, uh, January in D.C. at that meeting, and that's the first time where JBH, this is before he was chair, but, but JBH, or I might be mixing up my timeline as far as the year, but JBH was out there working to kill the CRM. Um, and this whole thing, you know, he may have gotten what he wanted. Uh, I think the CRM is a very positive project for the party. Um, it's something that, you know, helps the, the uh, and provides a solution. That's one of the biggest issues that state affiliates have. That's being, uh, you know, data solutions. And it's not perfect, but it's an ongoing and growing thing. And as it's improved now, all this uh, faith has been eroded in it, and it may have killed the project. I hope it doesn't, and I hope it can, still continues, and I'd encourage people to take whatever actions need to be done to protect themselves and their data with their affiliate and, and keep the CRM going, because that's one of the main things that that side wanted. Um, it's a very divisive thing. You know, anytime you get into discipline, the, the results are never good. And so I know people are saying she needs to resign. That probably might be the best thing that can happen but you know there's a devil you know and um you know it's it's just not a good situation excellent thank you thank you for always striving to redirect our attention to the important work daniel i appreciate yep, that activism is your... where we need to focus and everybody's not bad no matter what All right. uh, angela is angela still with us we uh i know she has to go pretty soon here i don't want to Oh, we lost Angela for her last word. All right. Well, then we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go to David and then Karen Ann to wrap this up. Uh, all right. So I'm glad Steve. Steve reminded me of something real quick that I was going to I was going to say uh, to your comments earlier, Adam. Uh, the the threatening of legal action that was something that I saw aimed at JBH from the very beginning of this there was there was talk of quote being held accountable to the fullest extent of the law i've seen that in dozens and dozens of tweets right from the get-go based on at both uh Gilletta and jbh so the, the he, he's definitely i i don't like the who started it kind of mentality but he definitely was not the first person to start talking about legal action in this situation that was very much the uh, the other side and to to dan's point there i'm i'm dis disheartened to hear that jbh was trying to kill the crm because everything that i've seen from the pragmatist caucus and, and his entire staff as uh working diligently to try to help ken Mullman with this and roll it out and i've been trying to to help get uh as much support behind there as i can and i've just started talking to to ken about it uh, a couple weeks ago uh, i've been working with tyler smith sorry karen Ann. Uh, and trying Why would to, I care about <laughs> that? Uh, trying to to figure out how to make this better and, and push it further. So uh, that yeah, the the Prague side of this, I d couldn't see any realistic reason why anyone would be fighting the CRM. That's one of my my baby projects too. I like it a lot. Um, but as far as you know, I'll just I'll just go back to what I said um, in the beginning. I think that JBH has done a lot of really good work, and that this is a clusterfuck that he got thrown into and it's unfortunate and if if it turns out that that there isn't a way to heal heal this with him still as chair then i would respect his decision to leave but i would like to see someone like him continue as chair because he has been in my mind the best chair we've ever had he's the only chair that's actually tried to push this party into legitimacy uh it, from what i've seen and i would like to see him continue that work Thank you very much, David. Apparently, Angela's back with us. I want to make sure Karen Ann gets the very last word today. So, Angela, this floor is yours for a closing statement as long as you need. I'll be pretty brief. I think that some serious damage has been done <laughs> at the national level. Uh, everybody's talked about the CRM. That project has been greatly damaged. The fact that the chair hasn't worked with his officers or kept them in the know on anything for all the, the entire time that he's been elected 11 months at this point is damaging. And now we've seen how far reaching 
that divide really is. It's it's not good for our culture. You know, he thinks that half the party is uh, destructive and evil. That's not good for LP culture. Uh, I don't like witch hunts, and I don't want to say anything nasty about him. I think he's probably a very nice person outside of this political drama. But I think that the only way to like kind of heal the party and move forward is probably for him to resign. And and I think Ken Mulman would probably make a great interim chair, and I'd support that. Excellent. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for joining us today, Angela. All right. Karen Ann, the last work, okay. work paragraphs, essays. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to yeah, keep it. Here. So to say that because JBH had been threatened by people defending New Hampshire who have had things stolen from them is equivalent to him threatening to sue an officer for asking him questions and in an investigation I am supposed to be doing. Come on. I don't even think David, Fla he barely said that with a straight face. There's no way. Okay. And also he did the sorry, Karen. And um, me and Tyler are good friends. We will be running a very friendly campaign. So there's never anybody who ever has to apologize like that. Um, I think that would make, it made me very uncomfortable. And I think that would make very Tyler very uncomfortable to hear that as well, because we don't have that kind of adversarial relationship. Um, as far as JBH being the best chair ever, I know people could be really surprised at me saying this, but Nick in his first two terms was the best chair this party uh, had ever had. Uh, 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 and, and then in his third, the worst. <laughs> and his third, the worst. Yeah, I, at, well, maybe not now. JBH said, hold my beer. Um, <laughs> and prior, prior to Nick, Steve Dasbach was the best chair. So yeah. maybe Steve Dasbach was the best chair ever because he never ruined his legacy the way Nick did. Um, <laughs> Nick burned brightly and then fell like Satan from heaven. Um, but even before this big debacle, JBH wasn't the best chair. He, had, he completely froze out his officers. He wouldn't answer my emails. You wonder how I had to get JBH to answer emails lately, at least because in the beginning, things were okay was to copy other people in order to shame him into answering. And that should not be the way it is. Mm -hmm. And other, and, and Ken Mullman, I don't want to speak for him. He could say that I misunderstood him. I'm going to say what I understand is that he treats Ken Mullman the same way. I've seen him treat Ken Mullman with absolute disrespect does not treat him as his vice chair. And as far as supporting the CRM, what a slap in the face was it that he didn't even appoint Ken Mullman to the IT committee or IS committee, it's called now. People don't notice this kind of stuff. I noticed this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. Ken Mullman mm -hmm. certainly noticed the slap in the face that he got. No, he's not the best chair, but he is excellent at some things. He is a great manager. I will give him that every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Like the detailed like um, plans he puts out, you know, his chairs, I, I forgot what he called it, but like his, his detailed, whatever, uh, he had a really nice name for it too, that I'm forgetting. Excellent. Like a lot of that stuff was really, really excellent. Is, is I, he I snowflakes like Donald Rumsfeld? Was it, was it that kind of thing? Oh, I don't No, I, I just, he's a great, he's a great manager <laughs> and, and, and I'll give him that. And he did have some good ideas, but, he purposely froze out the officers he didn't want. He never wanted me, and he never wanted Ken Mullman. And he treated Richard Longstreth as if Richard was his vice chair. And I bet that was very uncomfortable for Richard because he's friends with Ken, and it certainly was humiliating for Ken. So, no, he is nowhere near the best chair we had. Nick and Steve Dasbach were. All right, well... Karen Ann, what would you like to see if JBH does not resign? I would like to see the LNC have the balls to remove him. All right. But they don't. Well, and it's not a slam on the LNC. Bodies are just like that. Yeah. No, well, it, 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 I mean, I, I geek out on all the, well, how do we structurally organize to prevent this in the future? And, and to some degree, it's, not possible, but I, I would like to see the LNC composed of uh, 50 state reps, maybe, instead of 
the way it is now and maybe give it a larger body, maybe that strength and decentralization it, it and, and more connection worse. to the membership. You think that'd be Let worse? Me tell you. I'll take your word for it. And Karen Ann, we'll have to schedule another interview in the next couple of weeks after this shakes out. We'll follow up with you. And then you and me can geek out on all of our reorganizational LNC ideas. All right, one last super chat, Jeremy K. Oh, no, he, just somebody right. wants me to resign. Too bad. So sad. All right. Oh, oh, what is that? Oh, should we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you better, you money. better throw down. You better give me a lot $2. more than two dollars to broadcast that message here, sir. Two dollars. All right, Karen Ann. Two dollars. No, we we you a, put a pin in your fucking cheapskate. Two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yep yep all right karen Ann. anything you want to promote other than lp.org which i would also say lp.org slash free membership but uh listen don't let this kind of drama no i want to do lp.org and, and membership don't let this this current drama dissuade you i've had so many people go oh my god you're no better than the two parties yeah we are because you will not see whether you like me or not you will not see the lnc of the dnc and the rnc spilling the beans this you know, the doesn't exist in those circles right so this is actually healthy and if you want to see this party be re-radicalized for libertarian ideas now is the time to get involved because shit's going down yep amen thank you very much karen ann harlow's lnc secretary ladies and gentlemen and that concludes our panel our debate our epic debate on the issue of the resignation of the national chair of the Libertarian Party. And it gives me no pleasure to say this, but I, I have to say where I am on this issue, that uh, JBH, if you're, if you're listening, you should resign or address these accusations and all these charges with immediate full transparency. And I would say to the LNC, that if he does not do one of those two things or his explanation is not satisfactory, this should be brought to an immediate board vote to verify the facts and see where people stand and make something happen because this situation cannot be allowed to continue for the sake of the Libertarian Party and the cause of freedom for humanity, for America, for everything, for all of us, for the future for everything that we fight for, for all the reasons that we became libertarians in the first place. And with that, for those of you who are new to Adam versus the man, yeah, we do have this much fun. And then some five days a week, eight to 10 a.m. Pacific time, Monday through Friday. Good news Friday tomorrow. Good news Friday is coming up tomorrow. Refreshing. We'll give Jim one last chance to close out with producer notes here, even though we're way over time. Jim, thank you for hanging with us today unplanned i think it was worth it jim uh What's you want to mention on? our uh, our promos real quick are you are you happy with that conversation you happy to have stayed late work yeah, late for that yeah. one today yeah no worries that was uh that was worth staying late for it was a great conversation because we were going long i was sitting there with my uh finger ready on the close button i forgot all about promotion so oh we yeah, that yeah. Out real quick t.me forward slash adam versus the man is the public telegram channel feel free to join that everyone's welcome we love it uh, be a part of the show notes and everything else that goes on there. Patreon.com forward slash Adam versus the man is where you can go to support the show for one, five, 10, or even $50 a month. You can get access to for 10 bucks a month. You can get access to the private producers club, uh, which will get you 15% off free shipping, uh, all kinds of other cool stuff. Cigarfederation.com. I forgot about, you can use promo code Adam one zero to get 10% off the entire order there. Instagram has at the garden of freedom. That's the handle that you search for to find all the pictures and videos of everything going up there in Gardenia, the crypto six.com uh, visit that website to help donate and learn more about the Bitcoin church that was raided up in New Hampshire and go green energy online.com. The best website for do it yourselfers looking to learn more about uh, solar and micro wind energy, et cetera. Have a good day. And according to goodnewsnetwork.org, on this day in history, 1944, Iceland declared independence from Denmark and became a republic. So happy birthday to the Republic of Iceland. Mwah. Peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other.